Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is a former U.S. Marine with a combat deployment to Iraq. He is the author of Fearvana as well as the founder of Fearvana. He's an ultra marathoner and adventurer. He's climbed the Himalayas. He's trekked 350 miles across the second largest ice cap. Why not the first largest? <laughs> I know, right? It's the, coming. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Dalai Lama slid into his DMs and he makes Dr. Strange seem like a shallow frat boy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Akshay Nanavati. Thanks for having me, brother. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, you did. Right. You did. <laughs> I, uh, I should have asked probably before we went on air, but uh, I'd like to take a quick second to uh, shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Um, he's got a ton of different products actually within the Jocko Fuel line uh, that are that are phenomenal. Uh, the guests and I, you know, enjoy them on the show. I do outside. I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the, the Origin Labs jeans, boots. Um, they make keys. Uh, just a really good, uh, you know, company that's all about American industry, and they they do a fantastic job, uh, really kind of re-revolutionizing American industry. Uh, you know, from start to finish, all all American made, all American sourced. Uh, you know, everything start to finish is is all made right there in house, and and uh, they do a phenomenal job at, at creating the products and. And fulfilling in the whole ball of wax. <clears throat> They've been a consummate supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a long time now, uh, and I just I can't thank uh, Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for uh, for the job that they do for us. So uh, thank you to you guys. My my first and initial question: uh, first of all, you're an interesting motherfucker. Um, but my first question that I wrote down was, how in the actual fuck did you get the Dalai Lama to write the forward on your book? How did that happen? It was a pure cold pitch, you know. I didn't have any contact. When I first had this idea for Fearvana and wrote the book, it's a very spiritual concept. So I thought, who's the sort of most spiritual person I could get to endorse it, to validate it? And obviously that was the Dalai Lama. So when it, when it kind of when the idea first came, I kind of shot it down because I didn't have a platform. I was kind of like, who, who am I? Why is he going to endorse my book, you know? And then later on, I was like, why not try? What's the worst that could happen? So I reached out to um, his, the, the email on his website. I didn't get a response, so I did hours of research on Google, found one name and an email address, just some monk in the monastery there, and reached out to him. I shot a personal video for him, kind of sharing my story, what, what, I, what I've been through, what I want to do with Fearvana, the mission of Fearvana. This monk connected me to like two other monks. So three monks later, finally found the right one. <laughs> and then like five months of just kind of building a relationship with this monk, you know, really connecting with him, sharing my story, sharing what I want to do. And after five months of navigating that whole thing, he finally sent me a letter saying, considering everything you've been through and your genuine desire to serve, I'll press your case. And I only asked for like a one line endorsement just to kind of put on the front, you know, but he ended up writing me a forward and they sent me this letter from the Dalai Lama with his seagull and his signature that I now got framed up in oh, the house. Shit. It was pretty badass. That is fucking cool. It man. was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Huge honor. Yeah. No, yeah. that's awesome. You think he actually read it? I, that's what I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, he wrote the yeah. forward for it, which was like totally unexpected. I did yeah. not expect that, yeah. you know? Um, did you and kick it back I, to him with corrections? Yeah, right. <laughs> you could do a better job yeah, with this. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, it's it was a, pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's that's really fucking cool. I mean, yeah. when I saw that, I was like, man, that especially given the space that your book is in, like, mm -hmm. there's not really uh, an endorsement that carries any more weight. Than exactly. That. I'm exactly. also, I'm still reeling a little bit over the fact that uh, monks with email addresses. And right. <laughs> what the fuck is that? It just sounds weird. Uh, what is your biggest fear? still navigating um many the the one that i've kind of confronted but i still think there's work to be done is kind of the fear of stillness mm -hmm. of just nothingness like you're that's what you're afraid of yeah why is that there's um there's a challenge with nothingness there's a challenge with the mundane so i'm scared of the mundane i'm scared of the of the boredom i mean it's much easier for me to go running marathons, to go skiing across ice caps. I still have to temper and resist the urge to want to go back into conflict zones. Yeah. You know, so the mundane of life is terrifying. It's, it's, um, 
it's the kind of the extreme, I'm, like paradoxically, the mundane is the extreme I'm now confronting. You know, I've kind of explored many of the edges of the human condition. But confronting stillness means you got to be within yourself. You got to be with your consciousness. And that shit's hard. It is. I mean, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Exactly. Right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I get that 100%. Yeah. Uh, what's the most zen-like state you've ever had? Where and when? It was actually while confronting my fear of stillness, I went into spend into a, into a darkness retreat. I went spent seven days in pitch darkness, silence, and isolation. So Where it's the like fuck a, was that at? In Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, that sounds like a fucking That's, prison sentence. Yeah, exactly. My buddies were like, you know, you know, we do this to torture people. Why yeah. the fuck are you paying a thousand dollars to yeah. go to go do this? Uh, but I was like, I mean, I. I I went there to confront my fear of stillness, mm -hmm. but the the reality was I was doing I was kind and I'm only kind of recently become aware of this because I only did this a few months ago. It was an extreme way to confront stillness. It's still not really confronting stillness in the normalcy of life, right? I mean, you're spending seven days in twenty four seven darkness. You can't see your hand in front of you. There's nothing um, subtle about that. That's a fairly extreme way to confront stillness. Is, is there an element like is there a panic button or a fucking the switch is in the is in the room i mean yeah. the, you just you can't can, find it <laughs> you yeah they, i mean they tape it up so if you wanted to you could turn the light on and sit with your laptop watching movies all day you're you know nobody's gonna stop yeah. you you're you only miss that on the experience yeah. but i mean the these there were moments in there that i was sitting there and i was like fuck i got a long time left in the darkness but there were other moments that were just pure zen like like i mean you was seeing i was seeing lights in the dark and lights as real as anything else because they say that spending extended periods of time in the darkness your brain starts to release dmt mm -hmm. one of the primary ingredients in ayahuasca and so you experience these psychedelic trips like day five of the darkness i, I was i was kind of sleep i was sleeping and um i saw this blinding white light i mean blinding white just i, I felt I, I was literally trying to cover my eyes just because i felt like i needed an eye mask to sleep i was touching my eyelids like this because i couldn't tell if my eyes were open or closed anymore that's a trip blinding white yeah and it's but, surreal so a couple questions with that um do you have the ability to keep track of time at all i had a sense of days because you could hear outside so every morning there was a lot of birds chirping yeah. this is just kind of in the black forest in germany beautiful area <clears throat> so i had a sense of days but not a sense of hours yeah. other than like other than that so i mean i would be having moments of where you're just sitting still meditating that god knows how long it could have how, been how many days in before you jerked off <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you gotta ask that. <laughs> it's a valid question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did not, yeah. did not happen. Didn't happen. <laughs> no. well, so I am curious. So I mean, with that that amount of time of sitting in the dark, like, did your mind ever go to a dirty place that way? Uh, you know, for me, one of the reasons I went there was because after I went through, so I, well, I'm sure we'll get to it, but I struggled with alcohol and drinking after the war. And I kind of sobered up, but then after I went through a really, really challenging divorce, I broke my sobriety. And when I do like anything, I go pretty hard. So even yeah. drinking, I mean, I would drink like a bottle a day. You yeah. just drink until I pass out, and this would go on for six, seven days. And so when I broke, I realized something is still missing. I got to go deeper within to confront whatever that something may be. So for me, when I went to the darkness, it was a lot of that kind of stuff showing up, just confronting a little bit of my demons and, and navigating more. Like paradoxically, the dark shit I had kind of confronted in terms of, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's a constant work in progress, you know, like the guilt you feel around the war and, and all that kind of shit. I mean, I still wrestle with it. But a lot of what showed up for me was, you know, kind of lighter stuff in the sense of feeling okay with, with the right to be to, to be happy, to enjoy these experiences of life. So a lot of that kind of deeper stuff was showing up because for a long time, and it's still something I wrestle with, I've always struggled with, um, with why do I get to be happy? Why do I get to enjoy life when there's so much shit? I mean, you've seen the, the pain in the world, the suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond being in Iraq, I've worked in post-conflict zones with former child soldiers and leper colonies in India with victims of sex trafficking. And you see all this shit. And it's like, why did, I mean, I was born with a good family in India. What did I do to deserve this? And so I've still, I've struggled with that. So a lot of that kind of stuff was showing up and I was actually journaling in the dark. So I had a little darkness journal that I was writing in. And it was, I mean, it was really profound, uh, the stuff that was showing up, but it was, it was a lot around that, like confronting my own uh, experience with the meaning of life. Why are we here? So just really deep existential questions, you know, what, what are we here for? What is, what is God? What is enlightenment? What do these all things mean? And I'm not saying I know these answers, but like the answers I got at least kind of satisfied me, you know? Do you, when you go in there, does whoever is facilitating this, do they give you any type of guidance or instruction or is it just 
you're totally fucking on your own or what? There's, there's different ways you can do it. Like, so some people do it where one hour a day, a counselor will come in and you kind of talk through whatever you want to do, you know, whatever's showing up. Cause if you're, if you're, if you're going to stillness at that level, some shit's going to show up, right? Yeah. Uh, the other way to do it is you leave the room and you, you're still wearing a mask. So you're still in darkness, but you can do group meditations or group therapy, different things like that. I chose to be completely isolated because I mm. wanted to could go really deep within but uh so other than that there's no real instructions i mean you can do whatever the hell you want you know you yeah. could meditate you could I, at first for the first two three, three two three days i was doing i was working out in there but then i actually realized that i was using a workout to run away from the stillness because working out is more within my comfort zone i can do the burpees the running that's what i do <clears throat> so i kind of for the last four or five days maybe i said no don't do that don't use that as a way to run away from the from the stillness yeah. how how big of a space is this not big at all. I mean, it's like a little bed here, side table, you know. About like a prison cell? Yeah, yeah. Then there's a, you'll put a, you had a little mat with a couch and that's about it. You know? So with it being pitch fucking black, like do they bring you food? So the way they, way that happens is, and again, you can kind of choose, you can do a water fast, smoothies, or food. I chose to do the middle ground. I'm pretty skinny. I couldn't have, I don't have weight to lose. So I chose smoothies, not instead of a water fast. And three times a day, they bring a smoothie and, and they put it outside. The hallway is pitch dark too. So they ring a little bell so you can hear it and you know the smoothie's there. Fucking Pavlov over that, here. Exactly. Oh, and it really was. Yeah. Every time that bell rang, I mean, because you're sitting there, like, it also breaks the monotony. Beyond yeah. the sweetness of yeah. the smoothie, it just breaks the monotony. And every time that bell rings, it really was fucking like Pavlov's Starly, dogs. I imagine. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking, that's a yeah. the smoothies worth a shit. Oh, it was amazing. And yeah. partly because, again, you're just sitting so there. So every time the smoothie comes in, I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> smoothie. And you down that. Yeah. I suppose that's a, in terms of keeping track of time. But yep. they don't bring the smoothies at the same time every day, oh, okay. intentionally. Yeah. So you don't you don't know. Yeah. I mean, you have a sense. Okay, three smoothies a day. You know, yeah. you can and then count fucking yeah, yeah. yeah. But gotcha. yeah. this was it was a thousand dollars to do it. It was like, I think yeah, a thousand to twelve hundred something like that for the whole thing. For the whole thing. So yeah. it's not too bad. I mean, it's like in a week long vacation. You know, kind yeah. of what it would. Is it's there, not too. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel like we could do an entire podcast on just that <laughs> for fuck's sake. But uh, last question on that, and then we'll move on. Is what's the weirdest fucking thing you thought about while you were in there? weirdest thing i thought most, about most twisted most uh you know not not nothing like too fucked up like like in that sense it was more i'm trying to think what showed up in my darkness journal i was actually just rereading it yesterday uh last night before we met here um nothing too like fucked up it was just more anything like my, super random you know i mean the little uh, trying to think like little things i mean like there are moments where i'm just sitting there like just literally like shit i have god knows how long i have left in the dark and and then there's moments where you go into the deep profound experiences i mean one thing that was kind of really surreal i don't know if this is not really fucked up but really surreal is and i'm not like um i'm not a religious person i would i would say i'm spiritual but not religious but one moment while i was meditating so the way the lights that i saw for whatever reason i can't explain why these colors were these colors for the first two days they were purple lights kind of like a lava lamp you know like how a lava lava yeah. lamp lights move it was like that and then for whatever reason the purple disappeared and it was mostly green and then mostly red so one day i think this was day five or day six and i kid you not this was fucking surreal like sitting there meditating and looking out at, at the wall in front of me and it was like a red and a burning bush you know with the with like most the analogy yeah. being the most there and i don't know what that means because again i'm not a religious person so but it was surreal like i mean as and it's as real as anything else i'm looking it's as real as this you yeah. know it's so i i mean this is just my my dumb ass assumption but uh you know if if darkness especially that that amount of it creates dmt i'm assuming there's a psychedelic component to that probably or, yeah, yeah yeah so that's why you go on these i mean like there was one time where i was i was on this and i don't like I don't know how real this is, but the lady who runs the Darkness Retreat told me what I experienced was the start of an astral projection. The mm -hmm. astral projection you mentioned, kind of Doctor Strange, how they, mm -hmm. you know, your astral body can leave. It was like, I think day six of the Darkness Retreat, I was lying on my bed, kind of meditating, looking at the ceiling, and my arms felt like they were paralyzed like this, like I couldn't move them. Yeah. And I'm looking up and I'm seeing these red and green lights that look like the universe. And every time that would fade, I would just say, please God, help me go deeper. And I could have been there for like How many times hours. have you said that being married? <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah, I, can't, I can't help it. Yeah. No, it was, we, it was, it was surreal, surreal shit. I'm actually yeah. planning on writing, eventually going to write my next book in the darkness. I want to go spend like a month in there and just write the whole book in there. Yeah. 
Well, sorry, I said last question. One last no. question, I promise. Uh, the writing was your handwriting fucking all, <laughs> all fucked up. <laughs> it was. It was. I mean, my handwriting, generally speaking, yeah. is not good. But <laughs> it was mostly. Le- obviously, it's not within the lines. Like the way I was doing it, I kind of had a ruler, and then I would like move the you know move it down. Yeah. So obviously, it wasn't the line, but it was mostly read legible. Only one page I actually wrote over myself, yeah. and I still remember the darkness. I was like, I think I wrote over myself. Let me just like move two God, pages to. <laughs> trip, <man. laughs> it was That's wild. Some wild shit. You it ought to publish cool. that honestly. Yeah. Fucking, like or put that into a book. It was really profound. So eventually I'm going to go spend like a month and just write, like yeah. write yeah, and see what shows up. Yeah. Uh, what's the accomplishment that you're most proud of? Being in the Marines, joining the Marines, enlisting the Marines, serving, yeah. serving as a Marine. That's fucking, that's great. Um, do you have a dog? I do. What, uh, what uh, I have a little Havanese, tiny okay. little dude. And then we have a golden retriever. They're both in India right now with my family. I gotcha. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite thing to eat and do? Favorite thing to eat, my favorite kind of cheat meal. I do just simple as pizzas. Uh, that's kind of my favorite cheat meal when I'm uh, cheating. Favorite thing to do is... Type of pizza? Uh, uh, just pepperoni, yeah. nothing fancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do like, recently I've been digging the pokey, Hawaiian meals. Oh, yeah. yeah, that, that yeah. stuff's really good. I've been digging that. So favorite, thing to, uh, favorite thing to eat is that. Favorite thing to do is kind of the... Um, the extreme adventures that I do from skiing across ice and exploring humanity at its extremes. So it doesn't mean just in nature. So like last year I was in Liberia uh, doing some humanitarian work out there. I ran 167 miles across the country to help build a school out there. So that kind of stuff, whether it be skiing across an ice cap, I was just in Norway doing a polar expedition. So kind of exploring the edges of the human experience. That's that's fucking awesome, man. And I, and I can only imagine that each one of those experiences has a you know, maybe not quite as impactful and profound, uh, you know, effect on you as the seven day fucking, you know, dark fest, but the, uh, you know, each one of those, uh, you know, are character builders that you Without learn, learn yeah. things. That's, yeah. That's you learn cool. a lot about yourself, about the world, about humanity. Yeah. Very profound. Yeah. No, that's, that's cool. Uh, what is your morning routine on, on normal days when you're in town and not traveling or whatever? Yeah. It's uh, so I have actually I'm a big into systems thinker so I have like a checklist of what I do so I wake up I usually first thing I do is drop into 25 push-ups just something to get the body and blood flowing you know go brush my teeth I do a kind of thing where I talk to myself in the mirror kind of set my the stage for the day uh, then I do a 20 minute meditation after which I have this little tool that I call the spirit armory where it's just like a little book that I read some uh, things to remind me of who I want to be so you don't let those demons come uh, yeah. <laughs> come rising so i just uh, so I read that um and one of the things i actually like to do every morning is i read a medal of honor citation no oh, shit yeah like a different one every every different yeah. one every morning it just because to me those 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 like uh, the highest experience of the of the human the human condition is self-transcendence to me and those experiences you read the, you know shit the medal of honor citations are people transcend like just transcending themselves their own well-being in service to something greater so i read one every morning to remind me and then i kind of read my plan for the day like what is my plan for the day uh and i kind of write down one one little line of what's my main goal yeah. so it's a it's a this systematized kind of checklist going you, through every day what time do you normally get up 6 30 to 7 i'm kind of moving later because i'm really now i'm a little bit of a i work i like working into night yeah. you know some people are different rituals so i work in a night so i'm kind of moving it just recently started moving to 7 30 yeah. so i stay up a little later working in the night and then wake up a little later yeah what is your alarm it's uh it's actually the creed 2 soundtrack you know <laughs> no <shit. That's> a <laughs> you know the trip. theme from creed yeah. well, the, the montage from creed yeah. 3 creed 2 what and the, shit wakes you up <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i keep my phone away from my bed so i don't you know yeah. so it wakes me up and so as soon as it as soon as it hits i leap out of my bed yeah. jump into the push-ups and then get into the day so you're doing the push-ups while the creed 2 things yeah, yeah yeah and then i brush my teeth and then once i stop all that then i the, then i get into meditation uh and the, so the music stops yeah. and i do a 20 minute meditation yeah yeah on the meditation part, which you know for sure we'll get into, is is there a goal, a singular goal each day that changes? Is it the same? Is it what like when you go into that? What is what is kind of your frame of of mind? You know, I don't do any like fancy. I think it's kind of crazy how we need apps now to like meditate. I mean, I get it. Some of them have value, whatever. But like, I just close my eyes, and the whole goal is every time a thought comes up to let that thought float away right so so to to practice silencing the mind i mean it's like mental training that's what it is like folk training your mind to focus on what you needed to focus so i have some days where i'll start seeing lights just like i did in the darkness when i'm really fully present in the mm-hmm. experience uh some days not so much my mind's wandering with all the shit i got to do this that and the other thing right 
but the goal is just to let when a thought shows up to let it go float out and i i haven't done this in a little while but sometimes i like to because there's two kind of meditation one is where you silence the mind and this doesn't mean you know the, your thoughts are going to keep showing up the goal is not to silence the mind the goal is to notice the thought let it go away and to bring it back so actually like that's a mantra is always every time a thought shows up and just like bring it back to bring it back to the silence and then the other kind of meditation is where you actually allow the thoughts to go where they go so i learned this from an endurance cyclist friend of mine he's done the toughest endurance cyclist race in the world the race across america and what he used to do is he would sit still staring into a wall just staring into a plain wall so no painting nothing no stimuli just staring into the wall for up to 12 i think sometimes he said do it 24 hours but he would do it for 12 hours and then go cycling for 12 hours so in that time you're letting your thoughts go where you go sometimes i'll do that kind of meditation and in the darkness i was doing both you know yeah. silence in the mind and letting the thoughts go where they go they both have value but i guess the my my biggest question with that is that when you go into it there's is, is there a specific like i'm going to focus on this or do you just kind of let it take it where not usually yeah not yeah. it's just to, it's just to silence the mind to uh, uh yeah just yeah. to practice keep silence the mind basically I'm, I'm thinking the way i approach it my, my take on it my frame on it is that it's training my brain to focus to be yeah. present because yeah. that's everything I mean, sure. if you can focus you can get shit done you know yeah no it makes good sense yeah um all right, so from there, do you work out or eat other than the 25 push-ups? Like, do you do a gym routine? Or yeah, so, I'm, I mean, I'm an ultra, ultra runner. That's why my morning exercise isn't much. 25 push-ups isn't much because I do enough the rest of the, my training. So usually, right now, I'm actually cutting back on my miles because I need to put on weight for some of the expeditions I have planned. So I'm spending more time in the gym. But usually, I'm anywhere from, which is I know is a wide variety, but 70 to 120 miles a week. Right now, I'm cutting it down to about 40 to 60 and bringing more gym time yeah. because I need to put, I'm trying to put on about 10 to 15 pounds. I only weigh like 134. I'm pretty yeah. tiny. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good shit. Um, in terms of uh, the first meal of the day, are you a faster? Um, and so uh, I was, but like I have a nutritionist friend who like really knows the shit. This guy's like somebody I trust implicitly. If he says do this, I'll just do it. But for me, because the amount of miles I put in, he was like, you shouldn't be intermittent fasting. So yeah. what I do is what I've started doing now is before I used to sometimes get training in before the smoothie, but training is easier for me than working on my business. Yeah. Like it's easier for me to go for a run. It's much more comfortable for me. So now what I've done is I'll have a meal first and my meal is a smoothie because my nutritionist friend was telling me this. He's like, when the, in your most productive hours, you want to be drinking your meal because your body is essentially in a battle for blood flow between digestion and the brain. So you don't want to waste energy on digestion. So what I do is I drink a smoothie and it's a beast of a smoothie. It's like a thousand calorie smoothie. Yeah. And then I do a work shift and then I'll get my first training session in. So three days a week, I do two a days. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I do two a day. Friday, I do something called Fuck You Friday, where you basically <laughs> destroy yourself. And Saturday and Sundays are kind of longer runs. Uh, and Monday tends to be either like either a full recovery, which means completely off if I need it, or a very light session, depending. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you want to have some Fuck You Friday t-shirts made up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be good. Um, that's awesome, man. What uh, what is the in, in terms of the mileage that you're looking to to do the, on the next? Uh, expedition etc what what does that look like so the next one is not i mean i, I am probably going to run a few like i don't do many races a lot of the runs i do are kind of on my own oh, I so uh like the last big one i did was uh i ran 80 miles around a 0. 0.2 mile loop so 400 <laughs> laps going around this fucking thing it was psychological torture not just Jesus. physical torture yeah. but the next big one so i'll probably do a few like ultra runs just on my own between yeah. now and then but the next big one uh, barring the fucking world collapsing is uh, yeah. is in October I'm planning to do a three uh, it's a three to four week ski crossing of the Patagonian ice cap yeah. so it's the, uh, the uh, ice cap in Patagonia in South America it's gonna be an epic expedition you're like hiking you're cross country skiing you're uh, you're cl climbing with glaciers and cram on, on glaciers with crampons so that's the plan and then next year I want to go to the North Pole and the South Pole and then I have some uh, bigger expeditions planned in Antarctica and in addition to all this I'll do some scattered runs so I'm planning I think a hundred k run in india to to raise funds so a lot of my runs i like to tie them in with humanitarian work so yeah. that's like when i went to liberia it was about a marathon a day for a week to help raise funds to build a school so i ran across the entire country yeah. and uh she was sharing the story and we raised funds to build a school out there yeah so like from a sadistic fuck standpoint <laughs> uh is there an element of almost self-punishment that that you kind of revel in a little bit that uh that you know i mean there's a lot of people that that I think are that way. I think, you know, Dave Goggins is a good yeah. example. Like yeah. he, I think needs, you know, to, to just fucking punish himself or, or he, you know, I don't know if, if, if that doesn't happen, like if he goes off the rails, like that's the only way he can stay between the lines. I mean, is there some of that in, in your 
opinion too or there is there definitely is some of that uh, of like you said it kind of keeps you um it keeps you grounded there's a there's a purity to pain you know i mean you know from navy seal training and that going through that shit i did the online version (laughs) i got the certificate same 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 deal exactly yeah well but yeah no i i believe me i get it i i guess i've also gotten to a point in my life too where like my body is beat up enough to where I'll still throw a gut check in, you know, a few times a year workout wise, but otherwise it's, it's mostly just maintenance stuff, you know, I got you. To, just to stay, you know, in, in decent shape and, yeah. and some, some level of conditioning, but mostly just to feel good and stay healthy and, and whatever. You. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's at least been my kind of experience with it, but I, I certainly know, you know, plenty of people where it's like, it's almost a, a forced, uh, distraction that, that if they don't do that, then that's when they fucking they go off the rails and they really kind of you know get into a bad space which you know fucking everybody has their has their something right yeah but, well and that's you know. why i think you got to be careful i think that like like that's partly why i went into the darkness is because i it, you know sometimes even these quote-unquote positive things we can do like like when i skied across greenland or running ultra marathons or even working on a business can just be a way to run away from ourselves yeah. just as like drinking or drugs can be right it can just be a way mm-hmm. to run away from ourselves so i think you balance the that one edge with then actually going deeper into the self and that shit's fucking hard it's far mm-hmm. from easy but that's why like i went into the darkness because i noticed to some degree i was just using all these things to run away from myself you know mm-hmm. and i can still do these things which i do but you're doing it from kind of a different mindset a different level of consciousness than yeah. you were before yeah no it makes good sense yeah um all right before we get into kind of the premise of the book i would like to just touch a little bit on your on your backstory and uh kind of where you're from and what your childhood was like I, you're from indy you grew yeah. up there to uh, tell tell us a little bit about uh, just kind of where you were born and, and what that experience there growing up now you know being in the states for as long as you have been yeah what, what the contrast is and kind of what that was like yeah i was uh born in bombay moved from bombay to bangalore when i was three then bangalore to singapore when i was eight then moved from singapore to austin when i was 13. so moving around a lot like back then you know there wasn't was internet the way it was so every move was a little i mean i remember when i moved from singapore to texas we the the reputation of texas everybody was like dude you're brown they're gonna hate you out there you know so so i'm moving up texas and i'm like shit what's gonna happen here you yeah. know yeah. so uh so uh it, you know, moved moved around a lot as a result you're kind of figuring out i mean i had great parents that put me in good schools could not have asked for a better childhood when they when when, when i was you know earlier on my they weren't wealthy but like lower to middle class now my dad's worked hard and, and, and um you know made a lot of money and they're well off but uh, but we were still, I mean, good childhood. But when I moved to Austin, soon after moving moving here, like maybe two years later, that's when I got pretty heavily into drugs. So really, like, I mean, you know, for about a year and a half was into heavily into drugs. And just like I do everything, I was kind of pushing the line. So Like hard shit or what? Yeah, like uh, cocaine, lots and lots of LSD. I mean, I was at a point I would have done any drug that came my way. Thankfully, more shit did not come my way. But I was like seeking special K. I was like ready to try PCP. Yeah. I was like doing, I mean, I was in a dark, I still have scars on my arm. I used to cut myself, like burn myself, just do really self-destructive shit. I mean, some, some of the shit we did, I can't believe I'm alive to day you know yeah. uh and i lost two friends two of my friends od'd and one of the guys one of those guys him and me were the first two to start going from marijuana into harder shit yeah. and he ended up going down a much darker path and died i'm curious knowing what you know now having done the research and and uh, you know just going as heavy yeah. into the psychology spirituality etc you know post uh, war experience mm-hmm. Looking back on your childhood and doing drugs, what impact do you think uh, having those types of chemicals at that level in your body at that time of development has played a role into you kind of seeking that uh, you know physical punishment or, or some some level of, of not just struggle but bordering on like punishing yourself? Yeah. That, do you think that that plays a role? You know, I think looking back, I think that I probably had some degree of this, uh, you know, sort of the nature versus nurture argument. I had some degree of that element of seeking the extremes probably from a very young age. Like I remember when I was a kid in Bangalore, when we'd play rugby uh, in school and I would get cut up. I love those scars. Like to me, they were these war wounds, if you will, you know, even in Singapore, I used to run barefoot on rocks just to, t- to test myself. Yeah. So to some degree, it feels like I always had that and drugs just became the vehicle to push the line. Yeah. Now, like 
I haven't put my brain into a scan, but I'm sure it's all kinds of fucked up to yeah. a certain degree. I mean, from everything I've researched, a lot of the addiction thing is because they have the uh, dopamine receptors or like miss like I, I would guess I haven't put it in a brain scan, but I would put money that there's probably some miswiring in my dopamine receptors. Yeah. And that's why I still go into some dark spaces that I got to I got to navigate constantly. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it is what it is. You can make it work for you like anything. Yeah. So moving from Bombay to Bangalore to Singapore to Austin, what what were your parents doing to to facilitate those moves? My dad worked with 3M, so that's why we okay. moved moved around a lot. Uh, you know, they did the they they understood that it could be challenging. Put us in good schools. Really, I mean, again, like couldn't have asked for uh, uh, for more. But we moved just because of my dad's job. Because then after Austin, we moved to Minneapolis in my senior year of high school. Uh, and then after that, I went to college in Marines and kind of went down all that uh, yeah. road traveling on my own. But yeah, I mean, they they did the best they could, you know. Yeah. Um, they've asked me now, like, what could we have done differently to prevent you going down the path? I mean, I w- even when I was doing a lot of drugs, I wasn't very good at getting away with shit. I got like <laughs> caught doing drugs. I got caught drinking. I got caught stealing. I got arrested for lighting a microwave on fire. Like everything I got caught for, I wasn't very good at getting yeah. away with shit. Yeah. <laughs> did, did the Marines at least help you get a little better at that? I hope. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, did you have siblings and uh, and did you play any sports growing up? Uh, I have one older brother. Uh, he was 180 uh, from me in terms of all the dumb shit I was doing. Uh, I did. I was into sports when I was in Singapore. I was uh, like, and even in India, I was big in like all kinds of sports. Don't rugby, tell me cricket. Running. I did play cricket for a little while. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna level with you here. I, I, like I, I've been stuck in the Middle East during Ramadan where there's nothing else on and nothing else open. I mean, it actually it feels like the coronavirus now. Yeah. It's like fucking Ramadan in a, in a Muslim country, but. Uh, where there's nothing to watch but fucking cricket. cricket. I've watched hours of that. I still have no fucking idea how it works. None. I mean, it just does not make a, an ounce of fucking sense to me. But uh, at any rate, I did, did you, I did play so you, you played yeah. some cricket? Uh, any sports that like played a huge role in terms of it, it kind of uh, you know becoming who you were, or, or it being something that you focused around that you played here in the states and, and further, or nothing that serious. Nothing really that shaped me. I mean, I, I was playing soccer in uh, high school, but like at the same time, I was this was during my phase of drinking and doing a lot of drugs. Like shit, we were in the lock. We would be in the locker room with pints of vodka, you know, after practice. Uh, but like, <laughs> I was on like the JVB team, you know yeah. what I mean? So we didn't, we, we yeah, weren't like taking, see, it, nobody yeah. gives a shit about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but like, and I, and I was, I was a long distance, I mean, not sorry, a short distance, like hundred meter runner back in Singapore. And I was pretty good. Like I was pretty fast, but all that kind of lost it when I got in the move and then obviously got into yeah. drugs and everything. Yeah. But after, after that is when, when I, when I got out of that world, joined the Marines, when I started getting into all yeah. the shit I do now, like climbing yeah. and running and, well, yeah. you know, scuba diving, skydiving, like you name it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in high school, you're, you're doing drugs, you lose some friends. Uh, did you ever get into, into big trouble with that? Uh, did you ever get, go into rehab? Or, I mean, what, like how big of an impact did that have on you high school-wise? You know, I was still pretty good in terms of like my grades. I was always a pretty good student, so I would do enough to get the Bs and the As. I wasn't trying to be an A-plus student, but enough to, you know, not like, not have my parents <laughs> freak okay. out at me. So I, I did the did the bare minimum, but I was, I was enough to... Um, uh, but I was, I was, I mean, I didn't give too much of a shit, obviously. And I had no track, like in terms of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. That was kind of my whole world was that moment. Yeah. And watch the, like Black Hawk Down was the trigger that changed my life. Yeah. Watching that movie. Yeah. It's funny that I had a guest on yesterday that reading that book was, uh, kind of the, the catalyst for, yeah. for him serving. Much Watching there. that movie and then reading that book was yeah. the same thing. I mean, without a doubt to this day, it's still arguably the most technically uh, and historically accurate you know depiction of a, of a war scenario that, that probably exists yeah. you know I mean it's just it's so well done yeah but, um, all right so you move up to uh, Minneapolis you finish your last year then you, you went to college before you went into the Marines so I at this point when I moved up to Minneapolis I, I had mm-hmm. I, I saw the movie Black Hawk Down at this point I was ready to go in like I, I knew I wanted to go in watch the movie Black Hawk Down read the book and then just started reading book after book after book on military combat all that kind of stuff from every war you know Vietnam Korea World War II all of it uh, at this point I knew I wanted to go in but it took me about it took me a long time to get in because I have a blood disorder that two doctors told me would kill me in Marine Corps boot camp yeah. and then I have I'm flat footed I have scoliosis I have all this shit that I had to get medical waivers for <laughs> yeah. you know so it took me about a year and a half so I wanted to go in right after uh, right after my senior year in high school but I didn't get the waivers yet so I then like I literally applied one school late admission thankfully i got in (laughs) Uh, and so then i went to one year of college and after that uh i I finally got the waivers and honestly 
I, I think if it wasn't a post 9-11 world, like if there wasn't, you know, wars happening, I don't yeah. think I would have gotten in. Yeah. But I, I got the, it took me about, yeah, I think about a year and a half plus to get the medical waivers I needed to get in to go in. What, the, what was the, or what is the blood disorder? It's called thalassemia. So basically it's less oxygen. So the no, a normal guy has about, from what I understand, 14 to 16 grams of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin transports oxygen through the body, pretty important. I think I have like 10 to 11. Okay. So that's why with less oxygen, is there medication so, you take? Or? There's nothing you can do to make it go away. Like my mom has it, my grandma has it. It's kind of a genetic thing that I've gotten. And you can't make it, from my understanding, you can't make it go away. Yeah. You just, uh, I mean, obviously boot camp didn't kill me. I mean, not only did it not kill me, I, I graduated infantry school as the honor graduate, like, and I'm an ultra runner now, you know? Yeah. So yeah. you deal with it, yeah. Um, all right, so once you, did you finish college? Did you go all the way through and then join? Or? So no, I finished my freshman year, then joined, uh, took a semester off, went to, uh, uh, to boot camp and infantry school, then came back because I was in the reserves initially. And at this point, I was like, I was trying to go as much as I could. So I was volunteering to go every chance I could to either Iraq or Afghanistan, wherever the hell they would send me, to be honest with you. Um, and, uh, uh, but like Marine Corps admin, not exactly a smooth operation so it like twice they told me i was going and then twice they canceled it last minute so i didn't get to go till 2007 till okay. a few years later which i mean that's kind of at the height of the fucking the iraq war what was uh two things growing up both politically religiously whatever being family being from india was there a heavy political and religious influence in your family and life and how did that impact, yeah. you know, kind of your, your parents and what they thought about you joining the Marines and, yeah. and ultimately going to Iraq to war? You know, when I joined, it was it was a hard thing for my parents because one, it's like, you're not even from, I wasn't a U.S. citizen when I joined. I was a green card holder. So yeah. they're like, you're, this was post 9-11 when I even enlisted. So almost inevitably I would end up going. Yeah. So they're like, why are you going for to fight a, for a country in a war that's not yours, you know? Yeah. That was one challenge. But at the same time, I had just come, I'd been, like I said, I got caught doing everything. So it was kind of this, you know, between a rock and a hard place situation they were like on the one side this kid could be end up dead in a ditch on drugs which was very likely where i was going or he's joining this which you know obviously that changed my life and the discipline all the good things that come from that so they had a hard time i mean we weren't very like religious or political none of that my mom is a little bit closer to i mean spiritual again i would say but not religious right and so um they had a really hard time with it in terms of how to handle it and they weren't necessarily stoked when i first joined yeah. at this point i like it didn't matter i was so clear this is at first i was going to go army because army rangers was black hawk down right so i wanted to go army rangers then go into delta yeah. my vision was to go into special ops and stuff like that but i could initially couldn't go because i wasn't a u.s citizen so from my understanding to have go into special ops you need a secret clearance right and i couldn't get one as not a u.s citizen yeah. so i decided to go marines and then my plan was eventually to try to go into like at the time it was force recon now it's marsoc and raiders but um to go into recon and then force recon uh but they didn't you know they weren't really stoked about it but uh but i mean now obviously they're proud of me and when they came to boot camp graduation they saw i mean it changed my life and like i said it's one of the proudest things i'm you know i'm damn is is the thing that means one of the most to me you know yeah. being a marine so no, I, I think that's fucking great i i am curious from you know I, i've not been to india yeah uh but just from what i understand about it um you know, in, in terms of the, any, any type of religious influence, what, were your parents, was your family what you would consider religious or spiritual growing up? Uh, My or? dad, not so much. My mom could be closer to the, you know, in the Hindu, but again, not in a very, not in a very strong Hindu in sort of the religious sense. Yeah. She, you could arguably put her in the Hindu category, but more spiritual than like really following the doctrines of yeah. the religion, you know? Did you guys eat beef growing up? I did. My dad, my mom's a vegetarian. Yeah. My dad, we, we, I mean, I eat everything, you know, yeah. my dad does as well. So yeah. me, me, my brother and my dad do, but my mom was vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. And not to get too off track. I no. am curious from, you know, an Indian's perspective, what is the, uh, the holistic aspect of, uh, or the, or the holy aspect of, of, of cattle in that country? What, like, why are they so revered? You know, I'm a, I'm a fucking terrible Indian, so <laughs> it's always, when people ask me questions about India, they're like, shit, don't ask me because it makes me look like a dumbass because I don't know. <laughs> There's, I, I don't, I'm not even pretend to know how to yeah. answer yeah. that yeah. question. <laughs> no, we, we can pass. It's all good. It's better than I'm, bullshit. Man. Yeah. I'm a terrible Indian, yeah. man. No, I'm terrible. No, that's fucking, I appreciate the honesty. Uh, one question, before you joined the Marines, when you were in college, were you still fucking heavy into drugs in college? No. Too? So as soon as I made the decision to join, okay. I had stopped. I mean, I was drinking drinking but i but i stopped like yeah. like i mean cold turkey stopped yeah. it was like this is it because you know drugs was a barrier to entering the yeah. uh and i mean i was so clear this is who i wanted to be i started training I mean, when i first went to boot camp i wasn't very fit like i was 
kind of falling back on the hikes and shit. I was not super fit because, I mean, I started training, because, but I mean, I had just gone out of like a year and a half of doing heavy drugs. So yeah. obviously you're not in great shape, yeah. you know? So I started training in that, in that time between stopping and joining. Uh, but um, Unless it's but PCP, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're fucking everybody <laughs> and you're, up. And you're, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So you almost go to Iraq twice. Then you finally end up going. Yeah. What, uh, what was that like uh, for you? finally getting over there and, and kind of getting a piece of what you've been wanting to to get a piece of for yeah. several years now. Talk about that. Yeah. You know, when I went, I went with a very interesting and admittedly naive mindset. But like when, so when I first joined the, just to give it some context, when I first joined the unit, uh, there was this guy, Neil. So Neil and me became very, very close, like same kind of Marine and brothers. Like we were, we would we were real tight, you know, we trained together, we did everything together, but I'd always beat him by a few points. Like on the, on the run, I'd beat him by a few seconds on the rifle range. I'd beat him by a few points. Like I remember one Marine Corps ball, he had to beat by me and my girlfriend a drink. Cause I beat him by a few points on the range. He took his girlfriend. And yeah. <laughs> Exactly. For home from the Marine Corps. <laughs> exactly. <ball. laughs> Just by uh, a couple of points. <laughs> so, you know, so we, we volunteered every chance we could get and, um, and like we wanted to go to, together, you know, and, uh, and then both, both of us twice, they canceled it. And then one summer while I was ended up summers, I used to go to India. So one summer while I was in India, he ended up finally finding a unit to go with. Uh, he got augmented to that unit and, um, and I, so I had, then I come back while he was in training, you know, and so he ended up finally <laughs> going. And when he, he, he was out there. He got promoted to corporal. We were both lance corporals at the time. Got promoted to corporal, and as a result, he was a VC. He was a vehicle commander, and he was in a seat that got hit with an IED, and he was killed. Yeah. So I struggled with that shit because in my mind, it I felt horribly guilty that I was off vacationing in India when I should have been there, and I should have volunteered to go. I should have been there with him. We should have gone there together because we had always decided to go together. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I get it. Like I, had, I'm not naive about this. Like I get that even if I had gone there with him, he could have still died, and I could have still come back. But in my mind, it was especially at the time, it was like I should have been there. I should have gotten that promotion because you know I beat him by a few. Like I should have gotten there, and I should have been in that seat, so he could have come back. You know, he could have come back to his fiance. I was on his uh, rifle detail during his uh, when he was when he was buried in, in San Antonio, and um, so when I finally got my chance to go, it was a few months after he was killed uh, when we finally got augmented. I was fucking ready, man. Like I, at this point, it was like, finally, you know, when we got augmented, I was smiling, like finally. And I saw when I went out there, I went out there with this, again, admittedly naive perspective that if somebody has to get killed, let it be me. I don't want anybody else dying on my watch. Like what happened with Neil, you know, I still remember my buddy Cortez was cutting my hair in Lejeune while we were training, telling me about his family. And I was like, man, if I, if I can control it and you know, man, we, we can't control what happens out there. But, and so again, it was an admi- admittedly naive perspective that let me go out there. And if I have to, so be it, you know? So, I mean, I went out there with this, I wouldn't say suicidal mentality, but mentality that I don't give a shit if I come back and, uh, and I'm not expecting to, like, I gave away all my shit. I had all my gear from mountain climbing and all that kind of stuff. I gave it to people, all my buddies and stuff, uh, made it awkward when I came back. <laughs> I, I, get that shit back. I need that shit back. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, that's the true Indian giver. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 <laughs> oh, that's fucked up. But yes, yeah, so I went out there with that kind of mentality and, uh, you know, like again, admittedly, uh, very naive because you can't control what happens out there. Yeah. What but, What was the uh, the the climate like there while you were there and and where you were at? What uh, What part of the country were you? We in? were in Haditha, so um, RAO, yeah, was in in, 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 Haditha, in Haditha, which was at one point like the Anbar province was one of the the you know the the most violent provinces mm-hmm. of the war. General Mattis fucking love mad dog Mattis. He came in there, started implementing counterinsurgency doctrine to like help tra- t- change the tide of the war. But when we went, Marines had committed this massacre, like to this day, I think if you Google Haditha. So when we found out, first we, we were told we were going to go to Fallujah and then we got moved to Haditha. Uh, and so, you know, you Google Haditha just to try to, I'm, I was trying to learn the atmospherics of the area. First thing shows up, Haditha massacre. So I'm yeah. like, okay, great. They're going to probably love us out there, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, but because Mattis implemented counterinsurgency doctrine, the unit that came before us did a fantastic job of winning the people. I mean, it's the nature of counterinsurgency warfare. You win the people to win the war. So by the time we got there in Haditha, the people were really working with us to help combat the insurgency. I mean, the first week we got to Iraq, the insurgents cut the head off a local Iraqi and threw it on the streets of this town, Kafajia, because they were like, he's working with us. So this is what happens if you, like telling the locals, this is what happens if you work with the Marines. But it had, it, you know, a reverse effect. So they were like now like working with us to help find these uh, guys, yeah. you know? So we went closer to the end of the war. Like that, our, our unit was the last unit to have a battalion size element in the AO. When we left, I think, one or two companies took over. So it was kind of dying down. Our unit was the last. So when we went there, you know, there wasn't like, 
it wasn't the wild wild west they weren't firefights happening uh all the time and we'd you'd have pop shots and rounds go off all the time but the roes stated that you know if you're driving down the street and you have shots going off we weren't to engage because civilian casualties right yeah. so i mean the little things like that were happening we did have a company get hit with an ied our biggest threat was of course the ieds yeah. and and thankfully our unit and the unit before us did a fantastic job finding that shit before they could actually be used yeah. uh so we did a really good job with that but that was our biggest threat and like the insurgents were out and about i mean they were like they, they you know they shot a rocket air base and they were killing more you know how it is they were killing more locals than they were killing us like they the, the rocket ended up hitting the, the 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 city and killed four civilians you know so it wasn't it wasn't crazy and that was part of the challenge is like i wasn't at especially initially i wasn't getting the experience of war that i sought after mm -hmm. that i wanted to experience yeah and not to be like a war junkie or anything but you you know you yeah, you know, well, I mean, with the like, mentality. Yeah, I mean, it's like sitting on the bench, you know, in a, in a fucking sport, right? Exactly. You, you work all season to exactly. fucking get in the game, and then yeah, exactly. Like you want to you want to test exactly test the skills and and do what you went there for. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to get dressed up for nothing, right? Uh, so that was a seven month deployment. Seven month deployment. Yeah. When you came back, what was your mentality like? Uh, you know, upon return and and what have you? Were you was there an element of your mentality that existed that was still struggling with Neil's death? Yeah. Were there elements of what went on over there, um, you know, that were fucking with your head? What did you kind of walk us through yeah. what, what that was like on, on coming home? I was, you know, when I, first, obviously when you first come back, you're all excited. You're in, uh, in the world, you know how it is. You come back, you're celebrating all that. But not long after that, I was pissed off. I was pissed off. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like I did enough shit. I didn't feel like I did enough to out there. Like still struggling with the fact that Neil died. I didn't get shot. I didn't fucking lose a limb. I didn't go through really hard, like the, the shit I didn't go through. I didn't suffer enough in war to, uh, to be worthy, to, to earn, to like, why did I get to come back? Why did I get to, to be here? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I came back and I was, I came back to college. So I came back to senior year of college. And, you know, you're you, also the hard part is coming back to college because college students and, you know, we all do the best we can with our level of awareness. You can't sort of blame somebody for not having your insights and awareness from from what I've experienced in war. But at the time, I wasn't as self-aware as I was as I am now. So, you know, you, you look at these college students whining about stupid shit and you're like, fuck, man, like this sucks. Like, so I wanted to go back. So, again, I'm volunteering. I'm like, so let's go back to Iraq, go back to Afghanistan, wherever I can. Like, let's go back, you know. And I, I, I really, I couldn't handle this world. I wanted to go back because I felt guilty that I hadn't done enough. And, you know, so once again, I didn't get a chance to go. So what ended up happening is when I finished college, I didn't have a roadmap for my life. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was still debating, do I go career? Wars were kind of dying down. So I'm like, if it's a non wartime military what the fuck there's no point like why am i here so i ended up going to journalism school i wanted to get a master's in journalism so i could go back to war as a combat journalist uh and i thought at least the difference is because in the marines you know you have no freedom somebody tells you what to do you fucking do it and there's a lot of bullshit you got to deal with in addition to the i mean obviously there's a lot of beauty to the experience but you deal with a lot of bullshit mm -hmm. and so i thought i can go back as a combat journalist uh, and that was the plan was to go get my journalism degree and uh and use that to go back into experiences, to go back into conflict zones. Is that what you did? That's what I did. So I, I went and got my journal, journalism degree, and then the plan for the conflict zone, uh, the combat journalism plan changed because I met my my wife at the time in, in journalism school. So a, a combat journal, and I wasn't planning on meeting anybody. I was like, had no desire to meet, you know, things happened or whatever, met her. But the lifestyle of a combat journalist is not exactly conducive to a family lifestyle. Yeah. So that plan kind of changed. But yeah, when I came back, I, I mean, shit to this day, man, I still kind of struggle with that feeling that um, I haven't uh, done enough to yeah. warrant. No, I, th I think, you know, any A-type personality individual that that is competitive there's there's always an element of that i mean that's what drives you to to succeed at whatever the fuck you're doing i think you know um did you when you got back did you slip back into drinking and drugs uh never got back into drugs but drinking for yeah. sure uh and i never saw it really as a problem because again i was like always a good student i always a beta a student uh but i would drink heavily on weekends you know so and you kind of don't think of it as anything because college students what else you're gonna do you get drunk on weekends so yeah. i was just doing that and I was still, again, pretty fit. Like I was still running, you know. So it never, never occurred to me a problem. But I was when I when I drank, I drank hard, you yeah. know. And uh, but never got back into drugs. Just yeah. continued drinking until eventually it, yeah. And and so what? At what point did you transition from wanting to do the combat journalist to getting married and and 
kind of transitioning into the into the Fearvana mentality. Yeah. So when I you know when I met her uh, and then I realized because at one point I was either going to go combat journalist or be like a mountain bomb climbing in the Himalayas, but both experiences were ultimately I wanted to be on the edge of life and death. You know, I wanted to be within and without. I wanted to experience that. So I was kind of ex- planning on kind of doing a combination of the two. And then I met my wife at the time. So now I'm like, all right, that plan changed. So I got a corporate job after graduating school. At this point now, I had gotten out of the Marines. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I was always struggling. Do I re-up or not? But I was like, all right, you know, it's time. Anyway, wars were ending. So I was like, all right, let's get out. So got a corporate job for a year and a half. Fucking hated it. But I actually, like, the day I signed up for that job, I knew exactly what day I quit because I also signed up to ski well, across Greenland, 300 and a half, 350 miles across the world's second largest ice cap. Now, all these things I was doing, I was, I just wanted to go back into the extremes, right? Go back and ex, ex, into ex, extreme environments. Like Greenland is an extreme environment. You're minus 40 degrees. It's uh, like the following year, a British explorer was killed in one of the storms out there because the storms are pretty brutal. So did was do, doing all that and kind of still unsure about my path. What do I really want to do? I knew I didn't want to have a corporate job. So I had gotten into personal development a little bit at this point because even from like stopping drugs, and joining the Marines. And then, I, see, when I joined the Marines, I got into outdoor sports a lot. So rock climbing, cave diving, mountain climbing. I mean, you name it, skydiving. I fractured four bones in three months from skydiving and rock climbing. Uh, uh, so a lot, of, a lot of crazy shit I got into. And all of that led me to the greater understanding of the mind. How do we pursue mastery over the mind? So that kind of led me into personal development. So when I got the corporate job, I was getting trained as a life coach. So when I got out, so at this point, I'm kind of starting to build my business on the side, got out, came back from Greenland. I dropped like pretty much most of my savings, 15K plus to go ski across an ice cap, came How back. How long did that take? One month on the ice cap. We were, had like a 190 pound sled with 32 days worth of food and supplies to survive out there and then drag the sled for. So the whole thing was self-contained. Like yeah, it's fully no, self-supported. No resupplies. Exactly. Were you yeah. by yourself? Uh, no, team of six of us. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, so that's a trip, man. five days total, we were stuck in storms out there and the storms are brutal. Yeah. I mean, just hitting the tent and you feel like it sounds like the inside of a washing machine is just like, just shaking. And, um, at, at that point, like, are you guys just hold down and, and you, you just you ride it out? Hold down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, sometimes we were skiing in the wind, like one, one day we were skiing and the storm hit and we were trying to fight it, but it was like so brutal. We find, we set up our tent and, uh, and you're just hold down. And it's a very, it's kind of this paradoxical experience where you're in external chaos but there's a like a really beautiful surrender in it because there's nothing you can do. You set up yeah. the tent the best you can. So I still remember sitting there in my sleeping bag and just looking at the tent, just shaking, sounding like the washing machine. And you're just really at peace because there's nothing more you can do. <laughs> you guys each have your own little tents. No, uh, big... we we had so me and one of the guy were sharing. There was three tents total. Uh, yeah. Me and one of the guys shared one tent. Yeah. yeah. How many days in did it take before you jerked off in that? One? <laughs> <laughs> and how uncomfortable in that tent was in that it? With... <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, that's I mean like again like fucking seven or eight of your bullet points like are their own podcasts you know it's, <laughs> and and I got that from reading the book. I'm like, there's no way we're going to cover a tenth of the shit that I want to talk about in here, but. Uh, you have you have a, a lot of interesting uh, you know components to your story. It's really cool. Wild but Germany. Uh, all right, so you finish that, you come back. Yeah. Is, is there anything that you kind of could reduce your mentality to from just from that trip? Like, was there a takeaway that that you pulled from that that uh, that you didn't have before? You know, looking back on it now, um, now I see that I was just using that as a way to run away from myself. Uh, and I still remember one day in Greenland, we were skiing because you ski for about 50 minutes, you stop for 10 minutes to eat. And so it's a very structured way of life, which is like, again, replicating a lot of the military. There's ex- extremes, there's like, you're confronting life and death, you're confronting intensity. So a lot of replicating the military el- thing I loved about the military. Um, but I remember like one day we were skiing and I just, while skiing, just, I started tearing up thinking about Neil and I still remember it. And I don't, like it showed up out of nowhere, you know, because you're just sitting still with your thoughts. I mean, you're not sitting, but you're, you're still with your thoughts while you're skiing. So looking back, I think I was just running away, but I don't know what, um, when I came back from it, it was hard transitioning, just like it's hard transitioning out of the military, it was hard coming back. Now I didn't have any structure and that's when things started to slowly slip. So it's hard to say what the biggest lessons were at the time. Now I can see, but like at the time, it was just like, here's one more way to go do an extreme, extreme thing. And now I come back, I don't have any money left, so I don't have a job, so it's like, I can't go pursue the extremes. I'm, I'm married. I can't be going, I shouldn't be going off to war as a journalist. So shit, I got to do something, right? And and unlike the military, unlike a corporate job, which imposes structure upon you, you kind of have to show up. Unlike skiing across an ice cap where there's structure imposed or you die. Um, now there's no structure. You're building your own business. 
theoretically, you could sit your, sit your ass on a couch watching TV all day. Who's going to know? You know, mm. I mean, it's obviously going to affect your productivity and your work, but who's going to know? Yeah. So without the structure is when, I mean, it was kind of this weird thing. So I was, business was growing. I'm getting better, building my business, getting more clients. I was bas basically doing life coaching. But at the same time, slowly I hit a peak that eventually started dropping again because now I'm, I'm back to drinking without structure imposed and without facing the shit I wasn't facing. It was like first, you know, you drink on a Friday, then you drink on a Friday and Saturday. And eventually it hit a point where I'm drinking three days, four days, five days. And like I said, when I'm drinking, I'm drinking hard, you yeah. know, hard. This is while you're married. While I'm married. So, you know, what I would do is often... Um, I would like I would have the bottles hidden everywhere, you know, hiding under the sink, uh, in in the bathroom. So I, let's say I'm hanging out with my wife, watching a movie. At the end of the day, I go to the bathroom. I'm taking a few swigs. Wait, that's abnormal. That's fuck. <laughs> fuck. Wait, I gotta what? write this down. <laughs> I gotta reevaluate some shit. <laughs> the uh, no, I I mean obviously that's a huge fucking problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, anytime you're trying to hide something, exactly. there's a reason for it, right? Exactly. Uh, so at what point did you kind of? I, you, you know, you talk about the alcohol addiction yeah. coupled with thoughts of suicide. Did, did there come a, a breaking point for you yeah. that, that was like the light switch? So, yeah. So the breaking point was when I hit this moment, because sometimes my wife would travel. So especially when she would travel, I would uh, go to India or something. That's when the drinking obviously got worse. Right. But this time she was here. And I remember like after one of these binge sessions, I woke up and, uh, it, you know, the, like, again, just empty bottle next to me. And I woke up and was just like this pattern of drinking. Because every time I'd go through these binges, I would obviously realize this is horrible. I need to stop. Fall down the rabbit hole again eventually. And so one morning I woke up and I was, I was literally about to walk over to the kitchen and just pick up a knife to slip my wrist. And that was the, like, rock bottom. The fact that I would even think of, my, like, to kill myself. Like, how could I, how could I seriously consider taking my own life, you know? Because you see yourself a certain way. I mean, I was doing all this hardcore shit. You know, I'm a, like, a badass. And, I, like, that's not who I am. You know, I built a business, running, still running and stuff, you know, still doing, I had done all these crazy things. It was a Marine. That's not who I am. So that was kind of rock bottom. And it wasn't like a smooth climb after that. I mean, I still slipped back into drinking after that. But that was the moment when I started delving deeper into reading books, into neuroscience, into psychology, into spirituality, and to then confronting my own shit, into confronting my guilt around the war, into confronting the fact that, uh, uh, whether it be around Neil, the fact that I felt like I hadn't done enough. And, and, and I mean, at this point also, I had started seeing a therapist in the VA. Uh, what happened was my wife and I were struck, like I was struggling physically, you know, I couldn't, couldn't have sex and it wasn't a physical issue. It was a psychological issue. Uh, and so she was like, let's, you know, let's, let's go find out what's going on. And I didn't want to go do that. You know how it is. Like, I was like, fuck it. There's nothing wrong with me. There's, there's whatever. But finally went into the VA and that's when I started seeing them. You know, that's when they officially diagnosed me with PTSD. And, um, but the problem was every time I would leave the therapist in the VA, I would just leave, drive straight to the liquor store, you know, and I don't blame them. They were good people really wanted to help great people like zero issues with them but in hindsight now with all the learnings that i've learned is they're just operating from a really bad playbook in terms of the nature of the mind yeah. and so i learned to reframe my experiences and that was the moment that's kind of started the climb out that eventually led to fear of honor so i'm curious uh was there any any part of you that kind of from a self analyzed standpoint that you know if you're a life coach right but your personal life sounded like it's kind of in the shitter like, is, is there an element of you thinking to yourself, like, who the fuck am oh, I to uh, tell these people how to right? run their shit when, yeah. I, when my life's a fucking mess? What, Absolutely. Did it's you struggle this, it's, with Yeah, it's this weird thing because, and that's, again, part of the, when I hit that low moment, it's like, I'm fucking here telling, and I was helping people. Like, I, yeah. you know, like I was able to help them do, do their thing with this life coach, uh, as a life coach. But, uh, I mean, eventually when I, when it started getting bad, inevitably I'm starting to lose clients. So you were also seeing a little bit of a drop, you know, in terms of my business growing. But at first, like, it wasn't like I was drinking uh, it wasn't like when it, when, it, when the business was growing, I wasn't drinking five, six days a week. Yeah. And I, so I didn't, I wasn't aware of the shit that was there, you know, buried in the subconscious that I was just refusing to confront. And so as it started getting worse and worse and worse and my drinking getting worse and worse and worse, inevitably I'm losing also clients. But that was part of that, like that challenge of, of your self identity. Here you are telling people like helping people live a better life and look at you, you're a fucking mess, yeah. you know? So it was this who you view yourself as and who you are is two different things. And the reality is a lot of us find ourselves in that battle between my yeah. who I choose to be, who I believe myself yeah. to be, and who I'm actually being. Yeah. And Seeing that's a hard thing rose, to confront. Rose-colored glasses. Exactly. Uh, was there a point then, you know, where, so you hit rock bottom essentially, uh, then you, you delve way deeper into 
the psychology and yeah. and everything behind you know what is now Fearvana. What can you kind of talk to to how that whole came how that whole process came to be and and then ultimately writing a book and and transitioning your business into what it is now. Yeah. So, you know, as I started reading all this stuff to uh, to initially obviously just to heal myself, right? To figure out my own my own, my own stuff. Um, eventually, as I was figuring this out, it led me to the realization that the biggest problem that we have is the demonization of the experience of suffering, however it shows up. So, like as an example, you know, as I was starting to heal myself, in the VA, like I struggled with survivor's guilt. Uh, I didn't like loud noises. I didn't like crowds. And they were all they were all things that they said were symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. That were things that said, oh, because you have this, you now have PTSD. But as I started to learn, the, the, the thing was, these were not symptoms of PTSD. They were symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress is not post-traumatic stress disorder. There's two different things. And adding the word disorder is a huge distinction. It's a very important distinction. And we don't, we don't talk enough about post-traumatic growth. Like there's a great researcher, Dr. Martin Seligman. He went to West Point and he asked these cadets, how many of you have heard of post-traumatic growth? And it was like less than 5%. How many of you have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder? And it was 95%. So we've created a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that says if you've gone through some shit, whatever it may be, whether war or any kind of thing, you're going to be fucked up in the head. And to this day, I mean, you probably know, when, when I tell people I'm a veteran, it's like, or if it comes up, there's, I mean, I get it. It's coming from a place of love, you know, uh, but there's always this sort of sympathy. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh, like. It's more like pity. Pity, yeah. exactly. Like, oh, like poor you. You're probably fucked up. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And <laughs> there's no probably, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. all kinds of fucked up anyway before joining, right? Yeah. So it's this notion that, like, that, that somehow going through the shit equals disorder or that suffering is bad or fear is bad or stress is bad. I mean, the whole world, we say fearless, don't be scared, stress is the enemy, don't don't be anxious. We attach words like disorder to stress and anxiety. And what I was starting to do is reframe this and realize like, look, like my survivor's guilt is an, like, shit, I mean, veterans are not the only person to experience it. Anybody who's lost somebody often questions themselves is like, why, why did I get to live instead of them? That's a normal human emotion. It's a normal expression of love even, you know? So the demonization of guilt as a bad emotion, fear is a bad emotion, anxiety is a bad emotion was the bullshit that I was confronting and realizing that, look, these are not bad emotions. They're just emotions. Yeah. We can make anything work for us. And so as an, and as an example, what I did for a long time and only recently did I change this, we can talk about why, but I had a picture of Neil and me from the Marine Corps ball where he had to buy me a drink. <laughs> I had a picture of it uh, up on my wall and it said, this should have been you, earn this life. And so that guilt fueled me. It fueled me to write my book. It fueled me to do something meaningful with this life. I mean, I even like as an example, I found out 10 years after the war from my staff sergeant that apparently our vehicle drove over an active IED and for whatever reason, it didn't explode. I didn't know this at the time. Maybe I just missed it. I wasn't paying attention. God knows what. But my staff sergeant, who was a squad leader, told me that our vehicle drove over this. And and so well, confronting all this shit, it's like, dude, I don't know what. I mean, I could have died from doing drugs. I could have died apparently this stuff. I'm here now. So you don't have a right to waste this shit. It's yeah. on you to use this with something, mean, to do something meaningful. Yeah. No, I, and, I go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I, I agree 100%. I mean, that's been my take uh, and my advice to those that ask, uh, you know, fairly frequently, like, hey, how do you deal with losing friends and, and you know, what what kind of mental process do you go through to, uh, you know, to, to normalize it or, or understand it or be able to deal with it. And to me, it's just very simply like, if I if I flip the the fucking script and and I put myself in their shoes, like if if I was the one that was that was killed and and the guys that that were killed are here, and they were sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, wasting their fucking life, yeah. you know, being abusive fucking partners or parents or uh, you know just being shit bags across the board, like I would I would climb up from the underworld and I'd reach through and I'd slap the yeah. shit out of them. And I'd be like, hey, fuck face, like you have an opportunity that I didn't have. Stop fucking wasting it. You know, and, and to me, like there's no better way to honor those who, who, who have been lost than to, to maximize the opportunity that they weren't given. Like, yeah. I mean, it's really that fucking simple to me. But uh, back to the book, I, you know, there's, there's a, a number of quotes that I highlighted that I really liked. And this one kind of speaks to some of what you're talking about. Uh, you say... Actually, this is a, a quote from a, another author, author uh, built into it as well, but it's, it's part of, of yours and, and his. But if you don't choose a worthy struggle, struggle, struggle will choose you. And when it does, it will do far worse damage than the pain you will inevitably feel in the journey to greatness. As entrepreneur and best-selling author Jim Rohn said, 
We must all so suffer from one of two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference in discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. Pain is not a bad thing. The greater your struggle, the greater the rewards from the victory on the other side, which is why we as a society revere those who have triumphed over adversity and, and achieved success. Which, you know, the, I mean, fucking pick a, whether it's an ESPN 60 documentary, a fucking pick a story where somebody, you know, is being highlighted for something like there's always, they had this fucking shit yeah. sandwich handed to them and they, they rose up and fucking exactly. defied the odds. And, you know, like human beings are, are bordering on suckers for those types of stories, but it's for a reason. Like it's built in because it's all something we can A, relate to and B, I think, uh, you know, appreciate because it is hardwired in the, in the animal mind yeah. as much as anything. But um, at what point, I guess, when, when you kind of realize that, that not only is, is what you're going through normal, uh, but you're, you're figuring out how to kind of rewire and, yeah. and remap your brain, where, where did the, the idea and the concept to actually yeah. write the book and yeah. then start, you know, the company the way that it is now, yeah. where, did, did, was that kind of a, a transition during this time or was there a, a catalyst? Yeah. So, you know, as I was figuring this, all this stuff out, um, I kind of knew that obviously I'm not the only person struggling. Everybody's gone. Everybody goes through shit in their own way. So how do we? Sh how do I? Sh how do I get this out there? How do I share this with people? And uh, Jack Canfield, the guy who wrote the Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, books, I, I did some work with him, and I asked him once, "What would you have done differently if you go back in your career?" He said, "I would have written my book sooner." So at this point, I'm like, "All right, let's let's write a book." And um, I was chatting with my wife at the time, and I was, you know, we were talking about how do we frame this. And, uh, and she came up with the word Fearvana. And yeah. when she did, it was like, that's a gold mine. We bought like 20 different domain names and shit, you know, <laughs> like that was like, this is it. Because the value, like that was that, I mean, I was kind of living this lifestyle, but she crystallized it by giving it a name because it really represents the ethos of everything that I stand for. It's like fear and Nirvana are two seemingly contradictory ideas, you know, fear and this ultimate bliss and enlightenment that are often framed as opposites. But everything that I'm talking about from my own experience of coming back from the war, the PTSD, even before this climbing mountains, it's like the greatest things I've done were terrifying they were stressful they were hard from being a marine all this kind of stuff so fear is an access point to bliss and enlightenment mm -hmm. so that's when i started then writing the book uh delving deeper into the research behind it and uh, it took me about three years to write the book part yeah it, no. well i mean to me it, it makes me think and you talk about it in there is yin and yang right and, and exactly. balance i mean yin whether you're yang. talking pick, pick a fucking aspect of your life like without balance it's fucked up it's out of balance it's in balance yeah so, you know, to me, dog training is a great example. Um, you know, if, if you take a look at, say, operant conditioning where, you know, to me, really all dog training falls in one of those four quadrants, ultimately. I mean, you could, you could categorize it that way from my perspective. But, you know, most, th there's plenty of people in this country and, and in westernized societies as we become, and I'm using fucking air quotes here, more civilized, which is a crock of shit, but whatever, is that you know people are are more and more anti compulsion or punishment for for animals like across the board same with children like under mm -hmm. no circumstances should children or pets ever be punished for any fucking reason like there's no, and and you know I'm the first one to say well that's bullshit you know uh, mother nature and and the way the universe fucking works there there are checks and balances for everything you know now that that balance piece that we talk about because there's people that that you know talk about and subscribe to positive only methods of child rearing of dog training of employee management you know whatever mm -hmm. and, and to me like that's not how animals work and we're animals the same way as Absolutely. everything else is that yes overwhelmingly like your goal should be to provide a a conducive learning environment and this is for employees for for pets for children a coach with their athletes fucking whatever yeah is that you know a a non-distracting positive you know relatively sterile cohesive you know learning environment for that subject to thrive in and and make it easy for them to make the decisions that we're trying to get them to make to learn what we're trying to teach them to do and then once they make those decisions they're positively rewarded for it that makes a lot of sense however you know while while I would say that in in my experiences 85 90% of the time that's the the quadrant that we're hovering in there's also an element of good without the context of bad isn't fucking good you know and and so ice cream every day like ice cream's awesome I mean, unless you're lactose intolerant then yeah. it sucks right yeah. or if you think cows are so fucking holy that you can't even <laughs> grab their tits and uh, and squeeze the milk out of them to make the fucking ice cream here i am off on a tangent but 
you know, good is is subjective, right? You Absolutely. know, and it's also you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, what what's a reward to one dog? As an example, a tennis ball can can be everything to some mm-hmm. dogs. Mm-hmm. Other dogs could fucking care less about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that good concept a is subjective; it's relative. But more importantly, is that you know it it only has a shelf life in terms of you know, what the exterior driving forces are in that subject, dog, you know, child, whatever, Yeah, is that the limitations are if something outside of what you're offering and, and in that environment tempts them to do what we call in the dog training business self-reward, uh, and with, you know, people are certainly guilty of it the same way, is that whatever their their desire for something is that maybe they're not supposed to have or do or whatever, if that outweighs the reward of, of what you're trying to get them to do. Well, you don't have an option other than consequence. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and so to me like that, that balance that exists is what keeps everything in, in check, Absolutely. you know? And, and so, you know, from, from again, reading the book and, and knowing kind of what your positions are on a lot of things, I, I found it fascinatingly paralleled, uh, you know, to dog training. But, uh, to me, it's something that I get, I get relatively frustrated with, quite a bit as, as, you know, heavy into the dog training business as I am and, and having online training and have written a dog training book and, yeah. and everything where there's people that, that certainly chastise and, and want to be critical of using punishment in certain mm. circumstances. And, mm. you know, I've got kind of a checklist that I use before I, I uh, enact using uh, compulsion or, or punishment to, you. Uh, you know, to extinguish a certain behavior. And I'm not going to, you know, go into that here, but uh, but it is, it's, it's very calculated and I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts on, on what I just said as it yeah. relates to your book and kind of your experiences with people generally speaking? Totally. I actually, like, since the book, I've, I've kind of, ca- I called it now this term that I call singular duality. It's the idea that there's all these dualities, right? So the negative and positive darkness and light, uh, you can call it like demons and divinity. There's so many dualities, contentment and discontentment, fear and nirvana. And the problem in our world is just like you said, we demonize one side of it. So we think this is bad, like our demons are bad, darkness is bad, fear is bad. And the, like, even like if you look at discontentment and contentment, right? Discontentment is bad. We should always be content. But no, like discontentment is fuel. Yeah. Darkness is good. You got to confront that shit. So I completely agree. I mean, I, I'm not, by no means am I an expert in dog training, but as far as the concept around it, I'm 100% aligned because you need to navigate both edges of the duality. Like it's like suffering and joy. Let's say you call that one duality. Now, like, I mean, one of the things I do, for example, when I do talks all over for what you can do it in Singapore, India, Liberia, no matter where you do this in the world, I'll start with a slide that show words like fear, stress, anxiety, pain, suffering, adversity. How many of you think of these as positive words? Nobody thinks of these as positive words, but we think like joy, happiness, peace, calm is all positive, but you need to go to the other side. In fact, my sort of driving philosophy is that the path to inner peace is the pursuit of a worthy inner war. So you need a war in order to find peace. And I don't mean externally, I mean, even internally, an internal war. So you got to confront both both edges of the duality. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, as an example, even in the darkness retreat, like one of the most profound examples of my life, experiences in my life was coming out of the darkness for the first time after seven days. You come out, they put you on the on the, uh, on the porch, you're seeing the, the, um, the, the black forest and they take off the mask. And the way you see the world is, is unreal because you're suddenly seeing, it looks different than you've ever see, seen it before. And one of the thoughts that went through my head, one of my thoughts was I wish I could see the world every day through these eyes. But the other thought was this deep sense of gratitude for every bit of darkness and pain I've experienced in my life because I realized then in a very visceral way, you cannot see the light that way unless you've been in the dark. And that's, yeah, no, go ahead. Well, it's, I'm curious in, in coming out of there and seeing things totally different, did that dissipate or did it did it permanently change? I mean, it, is it like with you go to war, you come back, like at first you're like, holy fuck, I, yeah. I appreciate th- that there's even a Starbucks to go to. Exactly. Five months later, you're like, you, fucking Christ, what's taking so <laughs> goddamn, you yeah, know, like, yeah, so that totally. it, it, it dissipates. Yeah. And it, it, it does because then that becomes normal. So I was just having a conversation with my Merman Brady's last night, actually, and we were talking about this is that, so you got to keep going back to the edges. And this is why you have to go into spaces of suffering. Yeah. Because when you do, you, firstly, you can't evolve without suffering. You you can't evolve without struggle and you need struggle in order to, to, to get to the next version of you, right? But 
it also makes you appreciate the light. So you got to keep confronting the edges of the duality, you know, yeah. the darkness and the light. And yeah. even like the, the darkness is not bad. Our demons are not bad. Going into those spaces can, can actually become your greatest allies. And I have a very tangible example of this. Like, you know, I was talking about when I ran across Liberia. So day five of the run, it was no, I think day four of the run, it was a seven day run, about a marathon a day. Uh, it was maybe 17 miles in and I had this like aching pain on my shin, just this aching pain hit. So I stopped for a second. I'm trying to massage it, take off my shoes, put some cream, like it wasn't going away. And I had to hit the mileage for the day. So I'm limping for the next mile and a half. And then I start jogging and slowly now I'm start now I'm sprinting, just booking it. And the whole time my inner dialogue is saying shit like, you remember Neil? It should have been you that died in the war. Suck it the fuck up, earn this life. Yeah. And I'm in Liberia. This is a post-conflict yeah. zone. People have gone through horrible wars, uh, child soldiers, vict women who have been raped, have met horrible poverty. So you're like, look at people around you. People are dying everywhere. You have no reason to complain. Suck it up, earn this life. And my dialogue is this dark shit, you know? Like if you quit now, you deserve a coward's death. And and that ultimately, that five miles was the fastest five miles I ran that entire trip. You sure are easy on yourself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. You fucking pussy. Like you're almost like, uh, like fucking choking yourself out. Uh, no, well, sometimes you need to do the other thing. Yeah. I'm not saying no. It's not like I always talk to myself yeah. like that. But the point is that if you go into the darkness, you can access it yeah. at will. And both have yeah. value. No, I agree. And, and so, you know, to me, there's two things I wanted to bring up with that is that, you know, if you take like a singular you know, uh, I guess short term example that will take rock climbing, right? Is that, you know, one of the reasons why rock climbing is, is so addictive and, and powerful for people, which you can attest to, I, I can as well, is that it's, it's the, the glimpses and the snapshots and the, and the pulses of, of endorphins and, and dopamine and fucking adrenaline and, and all of yeah. these things that, that, you know, when you're about to fall or you don't think you can make it up to, you know, whatever fucking route you're trying to climb or whatever, it's, it's those struggles along the way that make when you're done with it, that that's the nirvana that comes from Absolutely. it. It's, it's the shit that, that you have to deal with to, to get to it. Because let's say you've got option A and option B option A is I sit on the couch and do fucking nothing, right? There's not a lot of reward value in that. Yeah. Option B is I go through some shit to fucking, you know, ascend or, or summit a, yeah. a fucking a rock climb, you know, and there's a whole fucking journey just in, yeah. in maybe a five or 10 minute route. Right. So to me, like that's as, as, as you're talking about it, like the most clear cut example that I can come up with, it's tangible. That I think people can maybe wrap their, their mind around, but like, that's a, a microscopic example, but all of life is that way, you exactly. know? And so it's like at a macro level. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can take that. To me, like, you know, people talk about micro decisions a lot, which I'm a firm believer in, is that, you know, your day is made up of thousands of fucking little decisions. Yeah. And, and every one of them can really be reduced to that as like, well, what's the harder fucking path? You know, what's the, what's the more challenging thing for me to do? Well, then that's probably the one I should that's do. Yeah. I mean, shy of like, hey, I'm going to take the trash out one piece of garbage at the time. Like, that's going <laughs> to suck worse. So why don't I do that? No, but. No, ex I get what you, yeah. You know, yeah. so like how, how much of that is is kind of the crux of the book or, that, or is it? Yeah, that's what I mean. So I define fear of Anna as the bliss that results from engaging our fears to pursue our own worthy struggle. Yeah. That's what I call our worthy struggle. You know, it doesn't have to be running ultra marathons. It can be anything. I have a friend who's about to be a grandmaster in chess. I have another kid I'm mentoring who's going to be going to be the best NASCAR driver ever. So that's like worthy struggle could be chess. It could be writing a book. It could be playing a guitar. But anything worthwhile is that that is worth pursuing is going to be hard. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like that term. Follow your passion. I think passion for what you do is a good thing. But often, especially in the younger generation, when people hear "follow your passion," it conveys this idea that shit's going to be sunshine and unicorns and rainbows, right? Yeah. But it's not. So I always like to say exactly what you talked about is that you know it's not about which passion you want to follow; it's about which struggle are you willing to endure. Any path, there's going to like I you know work with people. It's like I quit my job or start a business. Both is going to be really hard. None of that path is going to be easy. Or, you know, I stay in this relationship or I, or I leave this relationship that potentially sucks to be single. You can call any crossroads. Like you said, there's all these micro decisions. There's always going to be a struggle no matter which decision you make. So just choose which struggle am I willing to endure? Yeah. And is that your worthy struggle? And that's what, that's what the essence of fear of Anna is about. Because when you find your worthy struggle, yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, you'll deal with the fear, the stress, the anxiety, all that, all that stuff. But that will be the access point to nirvana as well. Hence the duality of it. Yeah. They come together is pursuing that worthy struggle. Yeah. No, I, I think it's fucking great. I, and I love both your book and how it's laid out. I'd, I'd like Thank to, you, to take that. this you know, couple of minutes to let you kind of synopsize 
why it's broken down into the three sections the way yeah. that it is and just just kind of summarize it for people sure because like i said i mean when, when i after reading it i was like dude i would need fucking 20 hours honestly <laughs> to go to go through everything that i've highlighted why i highlighted it and things that stuck out and that i would want to ask you about like we'd I be here all fucking that. week so to me like i i think it, it would prove more valuable both to the listener and, and for the sake of of brevity for you to just kind of sure give the the elevator pitch in essence of, of kind of why it's structured the way it yeah. is and, and what, what people are going to get out of it. Yeah. And that. So the three sections are section one is awareness and acceptance. So in that first section, I talk a little bit about how we work. I mean, if you want to fix a car, you got to know how the engine works. So how does the mind work? This is everything. This is what drives us. So I go deep into it. I mean, I think if I had to summarize the one key point in understanding that is probably what the, the, the chapter where I talk about the myth of free will. We think we are in control of ourselves, but we're not. Our brain mostly responds to the world through subconscious forces. You know, like right now, somebody comes into the room with a gun. I'm not pausing to choose to feel fear. My brain's going to respond with fear, right? We don't control most of what happens in our brain. But by acknowledging that, so hence awareness and then acceptance. So I also talk a lot about neuroplasticity. One of the most important things neuroscientists talk about is that we can change our brain. And by changing our brain, we change our life, our behaviors and everything. So no matter where you are now, you can change your brain. Do you look at it as though it's a muscle the same way? Absolutely. And so you, you yeah. train it the same way. So you, you train it the same way. Hence, we were talked about earlier about meditation. So what you focus on, like if I'm, you know, it, to change brain patterns, you've got to focus on the thing that you're not doing. And the more you focus on it, eventually it becomes subconscious. Yeah. But it's important to recognize how little we are actually in control of our brain. So a great quote that kind of summarized this, he's this guy, uh, P.D. Uspensky, psychologist who wrote this book, uh, The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution. He says, man is a machine, but a very peculiar machine. When recognizing he is a machine, he can then cease to be a machine. And I think that kind of summarizes the essence of the human mind, that we recognize that most of what happens is beyond our control, subconscious forces. Like I said, when I came back from war, I jumpy with loud noises, right? Now, that's not a choice I'm making. My brain, my fear brain learned to say loud noises equals death, so you better be more vigilant. You know, so acknowledging that I'm not choosing that, then you stop judging it. You stop demonizing it. You kind of accept the isness of that. This is just how it is. Now, cool. Okay, it's this way. What do I do with it? So you choose the space between the subconscious and the conscious, between the emotion and the reason. You acknowledge there's that space, and in that space, you decide what you want to do with it. Yeah. In the in the first chapter, there's two quotes that uh, that I, I do feel are important enough for me to say, you know, let, let's read them and talk yeah. about them while you're discussing the first part of it. Uh, one of them is is uh, t the context is talking about uh, a rider on top of an elephant yeah. uh, is the analogy, and it goes like this: We believe our human brain, the part that we think of as our self, is in charge, but in reality, our animal brain runs the show. If the elephant wants to go left and the rider wants to go right, who do you think is going to win that battle? This is why so many people struggle with changing their behaviors, even though they know they want to. When someone struggling to, to lose weight sees a candy bar, it gets the less intelligent elephant all riled up. Buying that candy then becomes an automatic response to an external trigger beyond the dieter's control. And then you go into the talking about yeah. the, the myth of free will. Also, it's uh, the motherfuckers who have figured that out in marketing. There's another uh, quote in here that talks about showing the the worst version of, of your or the worst possible potential version of someone's self is the most effective marketing tool, which, you know, there's some tricky fuckers out there oh, yeah. that, you know, that are just manipulating us as 100%. a society yeah. enormously. But um, the other quote that, uh, that I wanted to, to throw out real quick, and then you can uh, kind of talk about both of them is, Without the simplicity of having to worry only about death, we now have the luxury and burden of many other things to worry about. Our cave person-like brains don't know how to handle all these daily concerns, so it does what it knows to do and reacts to non-threatening life situations as if they were a saber-toothed tiger. As a result, fear lurks behind anything and everything, causing us mental anguish. To me, those two quotes are, are kind of synergistic in that yeah. it really speaks to the fact of, of what you're talking about and that so much of what we do, I think in our own arrogance, we think we're making the decision to do it, but in reality, we're, we're really fucking not. And, and to me, that's that's the, the irony that you talk about too, is that you know, uh, in some of the studies of, of our society, and I've talked about this on a number of podcasts of other guests I've had on, is that... I, I truly believe our biggest problem as a society is our own success. You know, we're a victim of our own success because we're so successful as a species that we don't have the struggle and we're yeah, fucking absolutely. miserable. We don't have 
things to worry about. I mean, and I've, I've talked about this a number of times in terms of why I take my kids camping every year, uh, because it, it completely hits that reset button of where now you're not thinking about what so-and-so said about my face at school yeah. or, you know, whether or not my fucking mortgage is going to get paid, whatever, like you're going off of sun up and sundown. You're, you're, as soon as you get up, it's all right. Do we have enough water? Do we have enough food? Yeah. No, we've got to go get both. What are we going to eat? Where are we going to stay? Like the only things you're worried about are right fucking here right now. And it, it's incredibly blissful that way. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very balanced that way. And, and, you know, when you think about just in the last, you know, 100, 150 years, you know, or, or post industrial revolution, we'll call it prior to that, most people's days were do we have something to fucking eat? No, we're going to have to go find something. You know, like there were so many yeah. challenges with just fucking staying alive and not getting killed yeah. by something, you know, that that's all you had to worry about. And, and there's a, a, almost a blissful ignorance in that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to me with those two quotes in mind, knowing that that's kind of the backdrop, what is your recommendation for clients, for people, et cetera, on how to fucking balance that in a life where that's just not how we live anymore. Yeah, I mean, exactly like you said, our greatest burden is this excessive comfort. You know, it's made us uh, more miserable than ever before. So it's about seeking out those experiences of suffering because that's the purity to it. When you're in these experiences, you, you're you forced to practice presence. That's what I like. I like to say that suffering is a training ground for self-transcendence. So when you go into these spaces, you're so consumed and it sheds those masks. You know, like you said, when you take your kids, they're no longer giving a shit about what that person said in school or whatever, because now you're purely consumed by the moment. And so you have to experience suffering. You seek it out because, and as I said, if you don't seek out a worthy struggle, struggle is going to find you anyway. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, we're going to suffer in life. We all know that. Yeah. So if you seek it out, it not only trains you to handle suffering when suffering shows up, it trains you to handle anything in life, it, the, even the challenges you're seeking, you know, whether I want to run a marathon or whatever, the more you train that muscle, I like to say suffer well. I mean, it's the most important skill to master. The ability to develop a positive relationship to suffering is the most important skill to master. And there's many techniques you can do, you can visualize, you can journal on you can track this, like all that stuff but like you can listen to a, you and me on a podcast you can read the book but ultimately you better fucking listen <laughs> you better listen but ultimately that shit is only going to be a spark yeah. the only thing that's going to get you there the, the greatest lessons are in the doing you got to get out there and suffer yeah. you got to go into those spaces yeah. that's ultimately it and that's the thing that's the hardest part to do like as an example you know i did this interview with dr drew and at the end of the interview somebody called in and they were involved in the boston bombing and um they were talking about struggling with some PTSD around it. And so we were chatting a little bit about it. Uh, and I said something about, you know, you got to pause and be with the, the shit. You got to go into the shit that you are feeling around it. And she said something like, that's really hard. And I go, exactly. It is hard. That's the whole fucking point. <laughs> that's the whole point. But you got to go into those spaces in order to get out of it. Like, otherwise, you're just holding on. Like, great quote that really summarized summarize the essence of this. Carl Jung, one of my favorite psychologists, he says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Yeah. until you make the unconscious conscious. So you got to go there. And another quote that really brings us home, brings us all home is he says uh, uh, that, how, how does he put it? He's like, he says that uh, to the, the enlightenment is not about just embracing the light in order to be in order like the path to enlightenment is not about embracing the light. You got to go into the darkness. I'm, I'm misquoting him, but essentially he says that you find enlightenment by going into the dark as well, you yeah. know? And so you got to go into those dark spaces. Yeah. No, I, I think it's fucking amazing. It's, it's an amazingly simple concept that uh, so many of us fucking struggle with day yeah. in day out and, and it's it's compounded i think by how easy our society makes it to to fall into those those negative fucking loops yeah. but um bringing it back to you know the finishing up kind of the first section yeah second section and third section uh, go ahead and I'll, I'll try not to interrupt anymore. no no all good <laughs> so first section yeah awareness and acceptance right second section is action so this is when we take the lessons and put it to use so i talk about what is the experience of fear of honor what's the mindset of fear of honor and i mean if i had to really summarize again the one key point there would be the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset so that and i didn't come up with that dr carol dweck uh, is one of the leading researchers in this she came up with that and the fixed mindset Said is one that believes talent is innate that you know that it's ingrained and we see that all the time you know tiger woods was born for golf roger federer is a natural we say that kind of shit all the time but the growth mindset is one that says we can cultivate anything through effort now this doesn't mean i'm going to be the next michael jordan or kobe bryant but you hold on to the mindset that no matter what is in my way it's an opportunity mm -hmm. so you, when you, with the fixed mindset a challenge when and they've done so many studies on this that are really fascinating with the fixed mindset if i face a challenge and an obstacle and i can't move through it it then becomes a reflection of my self-identity that's who i am 
am. I am that person. With the growth mindset, that challenge and obstacle is just an opportunity. It's an opportunity to train. Yeah. And I always like to say, like I, one of the things I do in my own self is I say there's no bad or good or there's no strong or weak. There's only trained and untrained. So when I'm talking about myself, like for example, I, I'm not the best with squats, right? Now I can say I suck at it, I'm weak at it, and objectively I am compared to let's say somebody else. But in my own mind, the way I approach it is I'm untrained. Because now when you say untrained, what does that do? Oh, I just got to train, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is just trained or untrained. So section two talks a lot about the action, the experience of fear of Vana. How do you apply it? How do you find your own worthy struggle? Like a little deeper into that kind of stuff. Happy to talk about it, of course, as well. And, There's just one thing I guess yeah. I want to interject with that in terms of, you know, we're, like to me, what you're talking about is incredibly idealistic, which is great. Like it, it's got to be that way. Is there a point at which you unsubscribe from the uh, American Idol mentality of no, honey, you're fantastic. Like, no, you suck. Fucking, you, you, you have you have no business doing this. Like, to me, the, the only I guess concern I have with having such an idealistic viewpoint as it as it relates to you know something in your way, like you just have to fucking figure out a way around it, whatever. Like, to me, there's there's also an economy piece or or an efficiency component where. Like I know as a business owner, it's like, yeah, some, you know, this, maybe I, I want to create this revenue stream that seems like a good idea. But when I really start to fucking dig in and, and pass crunching numbers, like we're trying and it's just not fucking working. Like there does come a point where you got to cut your fucking losses or, or like your stubbornness is going gonna, to fucking railroad you into the ground. And you're actually, you're ultimately going to fail yeah. at everything because you're so fucking competitive at this yeah. one thing. Is there kind of a point at which you say, you know, or recommend or, or kind of advise people on saying, maybe this isn't your fucking thing. Totally. So like, to be clear, when I say I approach untrained, it's how I'm, it's, it's in the things that I'm seeking my growth, but I am hundred percent about looking in the mirror and saying, if I suck at this, if I'm dumb, if I'm fucking fat, like let's not sugarcoat it. I think we're way too soft as a society yeah. being like, love yourself no matter what. No, man. Like if you look at yourself and see something in the mirror, you got to be real about that shit, you know? Like, and so yeah. I am a hundred percent about that. Yeah. I, I do think that we don't do that enough. Uh, and so if you got to face the reality of it, that's, there's no doubt. I'm not, uh, like I, I would not discount that. The reason when I say untrained is more like, for example, things that I know I'm working towards, but now I can confront the reality of like oh, my business, my thing and say, you know, I, I suck at this and I got to train at it. And then once I acknowledge the reality of the situation, then is when I move to the growth mindset. Yeah. This is not to discount the reality, if that makes sense. No, I, I yeah. think, you know, maybe my brain in the last, you know, 11, 12 years of being an entrepreneur is, is now so far into the like looking at everything from a cost benefit analysis right standpoint that. of saying yeah. like okay well does this make sense to put this kind of time in you yeah know, to me like i've said this a million times you know people talk about time is is money it's way more valuable you know because you can't make any more of it you can't, you can't exactly. save any of it you can't give it away resource. yeah you know so to me like if i'm going to spend time doing something like and, and it's something that maybe i'm inherently fucking terrible at does it make sense for me to dedicate this amount of time to, to yeah. practice something I'm fucking terrible at. And, and to me, like the way I always look at it is, is the desired outcome worth the time that what it's going to be fucking spent? Yeah. Like if, if it's yes, then well then let's do it. You yeah. Know? Uh, but I was just curious, I guess, you know, because if, if you're somebody who's coaching clients and they, they come to you with maybe some goals that are just like so fucking pie in the sky, you're like, listen, listen, you know, you just don't have what it takes to be a fucking NFL combine yeah. select. Like, you're just not going to do it. Like, yeah. let's focus on things that are more realistic, like yeah. having those conversations with people. And, and if, if there's a way you go about it, I guess. Is totally. Better. So with the growth mindset, again, like I, I can acknowledge I'm never going to be the next NBA superstar. So you accept the reality of it, but you apply the growth mindset to your worthy struggle that you're pursuing. So I agree. Even like, for example, I might like... I suck at accounting, I hate the numbers, I'll outsource that shit even as an entrepreneur, right? So it doesn't mean you train at every weakness. You no. weigh which are the ones, you know, worth it. Like I'm not the fastest runner in the world, but I love it and I love the suffering that I get to experience. I love the bliss that I get to experience, so I pursue it, you know? So some some areas it is worth going into the suck to train at that, to experience that. If nothing else, not even to get better at it, but to, to master the mind around experiencing the suck, you know, about training to suffer well, to exp yeah. to transcend the suffering. So there's, you know, what what I do is when, when, when if I'm working with somebody or anybody, it's like, yeah, confronting the reality that you might not be the next uh, Jordan or whatever, you know, or the next Tom Brady or some shit. So you got to acknowledge the reality of it. There are, gen so when I say the fixed mindset, there are genetic differences without a doubt that exist in each of us that prevent us from potentially going down a certain path. 
So you acknowledge the reality of it. And then once you seek your worthy struggle, you face every challenge with that growth mindset to transcend it. Yeah. So this is not to like discount reality or that pie. Cause yeah, I mean, overly positive is, uh, is not going to get you anywhere. Like it's about applying sort of a healthy degree of realism. And that's how you kind of find your worthy struggle is, you know, you look at what are, what, where am I on this path? What are people who are living? Ultimately, if I'm looking at helping people find that worthy struggle, we're going to look, work backwards. What is the ultimate lifestyle you want to create? So maybe some people don't like to travel, right? Maybe they want to stay at home with their family and that's cool. There's no right or wrong here. I love to travel. I love to go explore. So you look at the lifestyle. Who are people who are living that lifestyle? What jobs? And I put jobs in quotes because I mean, like mountaineering is not a job, but mountaineering could be the access point to that lifestyle, right? So what ways are there to get there to that lifestyle? And then you look at, is this going to work for me? You know, like, yeah, maybe it'd be great to be a basketball player and I could be the next Kobe Bryant. I love the elements of that lifestyle. Fucking not going to happen, you know? So let me acknowledge that. Okay, how else can I get to that lifestyle? Yeah. You know, and so you look at other ways to get there. And yeah. so I found my path now. I mean, it took me a long time. I'm 33 when I was very clear on who I wanted to be. Now I'm 35. But you look backwards from there and see what roles could get you there. And, yeah. and you really, you got to be, you got to confront the reality of it. Yeah. No, I, th I, I think that that's a huge and important distinction to make because I think a lot of times, in the in this space, whether you want to call it self help or uh, you know whatever the fuck you yeah. want to call it, professional development or or what have you, uh, motivational blah blah blah. But yeah. is that there's an element of like you know there's there's ideology and then there's realism you know and and to me like those two things or it's like there's in theory and then in reality type of thing and and uh, you know there's a funny joke about. Uh, a father talking to his son and they're talking about their mom and sister and the, the punchline ultimately ends up being, you know, in theory, we're sitting on fucking $40,000, but in reality, we're living with a bunch of hookers, you know, is, is the gist of it. I'm sure you can fill in the rest of it, but, <laughs> but you know, but the, I mean, to me that, that does strike a, uh, you know, a component that, that you have to fucking be honest with yourself yeah. about is that, you know, if, if you're so inefficient to the point where like you're chasing things that are so unrealistic that you're really just wasting your time. Like that's not going to get you to your ultimate goals either. Uh, and yeah. it's just, you know, it's important to be honest with it. But uh, and that's why I talk about like finding your worthy struggle or like asking yourself, which struggle am I willing to endure? Because when you do that, you dig deep into the nature of that struggle. I, I don't like most of the self-help shit. I think it's too fluffy. It's all about feeling yeah. good. And that feel good nonsense is bullshit, you know, because like, I don't, even when I speak, I, I'm like, I mean, one of the things I'll tell, especially the younger kids, I'm, I don't, I'm not here to motivate you. I don't care if you walk out of this room with a smile. You know, uh, my goal is to give you tools that, because when you go back out of this talk, I mean, many speeches, right? We see seminars, people feel good. They go back to the world. What happened? Pain hits. Yeah. And then yeah. what are you going to do? So when you, when you dig deep into which struggle am I willing to endure, then you can start getting clear. Okay. Let's say I'm, let's say I'm, I'm I decide I want to be a Kobe. And then I start digging deep. Is this a struggle I'm willing to endure? You know what? It's just not going to happen. Then I can realize that this struggle is really going to get me nowhere. So that's what, you know, so I, I totally resonate. It's about like asking yourself, which struggle am I willing to endure and not just the feel good, all that feel good stuff. And, you know, and it's not, if you visualize yourself sitting on the beach with a million dollars, it's not going to happen. You got to, it's good. You got to suffer to get there. Yeah. You know, you really got to suffer to get yeah. there. Yeah. That's no shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So wrapping up uh, the second section, I guess, um, and moving into kind of the third, what, uh, what's your, your take on that? The third section is called awakening. So it's kind of this cycle, the, you know, awareness, you take an action, with action comes a new awareness. And then what happens is I call it your awakening. This is when you kind of evolve into that next level of yourself. I always like to think of yourself in versions, you know, so there's Akshay 72, Akshay 73, and each, each obstacle, each pain point, each uh, challenge you experience or each things you seek out is an opportunity to reach the next awakening. And on the other side of that awakening is a new self. You attain the sort of the next version of yourself, the next greatest uh, version of yourself. And that's what the, ne the third section is about. Uh, I kind of quote my friend, Bobby, Maximus, who's kind of my fitness mentor, he says, you know, the two hours in the gym is, is just one part of it. You know, if I go work out two hours, there's other 22 hours that also matter. And that's really where it happens. It's, you know, I can go run, but I got to eat healthy. I got to sleep right. I got to recover right. I got to do all the other shit. So the awakening is about doing all that other stuff. And what do you do in this? Because it's not just about suffering for the sake of suffering. Mm -hmm. It's not just about go, doing that, you know? It's about reflecting on it, then taking the lessons from it, applying it to the next self. And that's really the whole cyclical process of the essence of Firavana is exercising awareness, 
understanding the self, taking an action, got to take an action. With every action, there's an awareness that comes from that action. And then attaining the awakening, attaining the next level of consciousness. What is the key insight? You know, So all these things I've done from skiing across Greenland, joining the Marines, to going in darkness, there's some awakening that happens. And then you got to practice that. I mean, the battle is relentless. Like you got to keep holding on to it, practicing it, realizing it, like understanding it, and then applying it to the next action to attain that next version of yourself. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think the, you know, the biggest takeaway, um, you know, to, to kind of summarize in, in one statement that I took from the book, uh, which there was a lot of them, but uh, the thing that kind of sticks out the most is, is that is that it's constant. constant. You know, you know I, I think so many people think, well, like, if I just get to this point, then I'll yeah. be good. Like, no, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's... There'll be some new shit. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, fucking money is a good example, right? Is that, you know, most people... Like, you know, I'll even use myself as an example. If I think back five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if I, looking at those versions of myself and thinking back then, if I was where I was now, like, or even if if I was to say, this is where you'll be at this age, I'd be like, oh, I'd be fucking, I'll be happy with that. No, you won't. <laughs> Motherfucker, no, you won't. Yeah, yeah. Like, part of it is greed. Part of it is human nature. Um, you know, but to me, the, the greed, not in a bad way, more of in a competitiveness in that, you know, you're, you're never truly satisfied with yeah. where you're at because if you are, then you become fucking miserable. Complacency, yeah. You get complacency kills, man. Like, so yeah. yeah. So that's why contentment is not, you don't want to fully be. Yeah. And I always like to say it too, like, I mean, to your point is that progress, one of the things I, I teach is that progress is not the elimination of problems. Progress is the creation of new problems. Yeah. And there will always be problems. There will yeah. always be. So the way you grow is really, ultimately it's two things. Find the problem, fix the problem, find what's working and do more of it. Yeah. So at the simplest level, all growth is those two things. Yeah. But you gotta be seeking a problem. I mean, there, the problems are there anyway. Yeah. So seek out that next problem because on the other side of that is that next awakening, is that next self. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we, and we see people all the time, right? Who seemingly have all the money in the world. They're not, they got their own problems. Yeah. Everybody's got shit. Yeah, I mean, you're I, not going to get there wherever yeah. there is. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've I've been in a unique position in terms of uh, you know selling personal protection dogs to, to yeah. high net worth folks that you know have learned a lot of lessons uh, over the years on you know how they manage money and and some you know business concepts that they have and whatever and and you know the two two biggest takeaways from that is uh, number one is that you know everybody you know every single fucking person that i've ever met that's successful has one thing in common no matter what the industry no matter what they're upbringing mm. you know no matter what their lot in life no matter what the fuck they're doing no matter where they were born all, all of those things completely irrespective of the fact that every single one of them is persistent as fuck and never gives up no matter how bad shit gets they never fucking give up, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's something very simple. It's really fucking hard to practice when you get yeah. kicked in the fucking teeth and, yeah. and whatever is to say, I'm going to, I'm going to keep fucking going until I make it. But the other thing too, is that it's, it's really just all zeros, whether it's one zero or 30 fucking zeros is that, is that your problems are the exact same. You know, no, no matter what, like whether you have fucking $20 billion yeah. or $2,000 is that, you know, it's a matter of zeros and your, your problems are all relative within that space of, of that amount of money. And so uh, I think, you know, too many times most people look at, you know, people that are, are wealthy or super wealthy or mega wealthy or hyper wealthy or whatever the fuck you want to call it and think that oh, they must be just fucking the, blissfully yeah. happy and they have no problems. Yeah. Like they're every fucking bit as miserable and, and you know, some Sometimes of them more so, yeah. you know, some of them are more miserable than, than the, the person that's struggling to get by paycheck yeah. to paycheck Beca yeah. because of that struggle. They, you know, they don't have the ability to become emotionally complacent exactly. and, and fucking miserable. But, yeah. um, one of the things I did write down that I, I did want to talk about, because I know how big of a role it plays in my life and, and a lot of people in, in my life, uh, you know, their, their circumstances is nutrition. Um, and, and, fueling your body brain because your brain is, is a, a machine your body's yeah. a machine consciousness all that you know it, just like everything else it needs to be fueled properly and when yeah. it's not it's not going to uh, you know operate at, at the highest level that it can possibly operate uh -huh. how much of that do you kind of employ into your uh, into your your business as it relates to you know uh, advising people yeah. to to live a certain way you know what how much do you talk about nutrition and and uh, how big of a role does it play in your life 
I'm not a nutritionalist by any means, but I know enough to eat healthy. And it plays a huge role. I mean, you can see the difference when I, I feel the difference when I'm eating right versus when I'm not. Because like you said, body, mind, spirit, they're all connected. One is going to affect the other. So it's really important that you take care of one and, and, train, and train it and use it as a tool to help the other. So they all coexist. So I mean, for me, nutrition is very, very important. It's very systematized. So I don't think about it. Like this is the value in creating systems is you don't have to waste your cognitive energy on making daily decisions you save it for the for the hard things for the struggle for the fight whatever the mm. fight may be uh so nutrition is very systematized for me you know and uh and even when i work with i mean if anybody i work with like it's like if you're not going to implement an exercise routine i'm not even going to work with you you know so because exercise is one of the best things you can do for your brain so working training your body is one of the best things you can even do for your brain on a neurological level one neuroscientist calls exercise miracle growth for the brain so yeah nutrition exercise they're fundamental they're yeah. core uh yeah. you can't you can't go down that worthy struggle without putting without taking that into effect it's yeah. not gonna it's just not gonna work you know yeah. is that something that i mean it's easy to say you need to make sure you're eating right yeah one of the biggest problems i think in our society is well what the fuck does that does even that mean, mean? because <laughs> you know you talk to 10 different people you'll get and 12 they, different answers yeah. uh, and they and they're largely conflicting you know and so to me that's that's one of the biggest struggles i've seen with people is is they they think that they're that they're eating clean and, and they're like oh, no i i eat healthy as fuck like actually no you don't like yeah. you eat fucking terrible and you just don't even realize it yeah like to me that that's one of the biggest hurdles i think with and, and same with exercise exercise i think there's more flexibility in and that it's a little more tangible and then it's like well the last time i did this i tore both my rotator cuffs so i'm probably going to need to you know lighten the weight up or pick a different fucking exercise or whatever whereas nutrition is is so much more subtle and fucking yeah. sneaky where it's like you know we talked about the marketing component you know dog food is the same way like most or a lot of dry dog foods are fucking terrible for dogs mm -hmm. you know they cause cancer they cause brain mm -hmm. problems they, they cause hormonal imbalances they cause fucking skin allergies they cause leaky gut they cause digestive and fucking gi problems all of the same things that a lot of mainstream yeah. foods do for us something as simple as vegetable oils, you know, or excess sugar and carbohydrates, you know, things that legitimately fuck your brain up yeah. that make it impossible, uh, you know, to, to, um, employ some of the fucking concepts and yeah. tactics that yeah. you talk in your yeah. book. And so to me, like nutrition is, is one of those black sheep that I think is, is so underutilized, uh, and hamstring so many fucking people way harder than yeah. than it needs to you know in, in my team dog uh, book that i wrote about it's you know it, it's about dog training but it's similarly like it's not just training it's it's all of the it's the other 95 percent of your day that exists around the training around that, that's yeah. going to either make training way fucking harder or way fucking easier you know and to me like nutrition plays such a fucking big role in that and something just as simple as cutting out most complex carbohydrates getting rid of all all fucking sugar you know eating as as clean a meat as you can you can source possibly which is ideally you know ranch raised grass fed across the board with no bullshit in yeah. it which doesn't taste anywhere near as good as fucking wagyu <laughs> grain finished fucking you know beer massaged fucking <laughs> japanese cattle does but you know just like with us right if, yeah. if you eat shit you're going to be unhealthy well if the animals you eat are eating shit guess then, what then you're absolutely. you're basically eating shit also and yeah. so i think a lot of times people people don't realize that cutting out vegetable oils as another example is that that shit is fucking poisonous 99 percent of every restaurant you've ever been to cooks almost everything in fucking vegetable oils canola fucking you know whatever corn oil you know just shit uh, you know, they, they're sautéing vegetables, they're grilling their meat with it, they're, you know, keeping the eggs from sticking yeah. and baking it. It's all in the, these toxic oils that over time fuck your brain up and cause a lot of problems and create an inability to implement a lot of the concepts that yeah. you talk in this book. And so, it, you know, to me, like, not that you're asking for my recommendation, but to me, like, ha having a an exercise... You know, almost thinking of it like a fucking triangle is, you know, there's there's the mind, there's, you know, the, the physical component, and then there's the, the fuel, the nutritional yeah. component. Like those th three things are all interconnected and, and need to be equally Absolutely. addressed, you know. But Absolutely. Um, and you're right, man. Like it is hard because you – like sometimes I go to Costco and you will see people who – think they're you can tell by what they have in their cart they think they're eating healthy but mm -hmm. there's a lot of that like branding people who are you know the brands you'll see who market themselves as healthy but if you just look at the ingredients they're far from it you yeah. know so like i mean it is very complicated there's also like 100 different diets so i don't do any of that this that and the other paleo keto this that i keep it fairly simple like i mean i share mine what i do in my morning smoothie is berries 
vegetables, uh, chia seeds, MCT oil, uh, a banana, and protein, uh, plant-based protein powder, you know? And then sometimes I'll add hemp seeds and stuff like that. And then my dinner is basically a hefty salad. So again, all greens, putting in like maybe goji berries. I have different concoctions of stuff, you know, nuts. Uh, and it's the same thing. So I have a huge concoction of a list of stuff that I keep in my fr fridge. And so different days I'll keep different stuff, like salmon or, you know, the, again, the uh, uh, egg, but all organic, all that kind of stuff. Like you said, because the animal eats that, you know, you gotta be careful the kind of chicken you buy. So I keep it fairly simple and, you know, it is complicated, but at the same time, like if you do the b basics, like eat a lot of vegetables, eating the right kind of meat, you know, it's, Keep it like I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. I mostly have cut off gluten from my diet, you know. Um, it just it, it keeps it simple without worrying about the hundred different kind of fad diets they are. Yeah. But I couldn't agree with you more, man. It is it is confusing. So you got to like anything, you got to invest the time to to do the research, do the work if it matters to you because yeah. it does matter. And yeah. you got to put in the work to to study it a little bit. So I have a nutritionist friend who kind of counseled me, yeah. uh, and then put some time into researching it. So now I kind of have a plan laid out for how I do it, you know. Yeah. To me, again, you got the nutritionist friend. I'm not a nutritionist, but to me, yeah, one either. thing I would say, uh, you know, I, I would say maybe try is is replace um, the plant based protein with a whey protein, like for 30 days, and see if that changes anything for you. You know, I, I would, I'd say, give it a shot. But obviously, he, you know, if he's got you on that, it's for a reason. But from my experience and everything that I've looked at, uh, you know, t taking in more protein than most people do and far less carbohydrates. And making sure that that protein source is is largely animal based and, and clean animal based is really the key component to that. Is that. When, when it's shitty animal based, then yeah, it causes a lot of fucking yeah. problems. But uh, anyway, just just a thought. Again, not not to get too off the fucking rails on it, but I, I I'm pretty fucking passionate about it. But oh, I feel you. Um, I feel you, man. Yeah. One uh, another thing I had written down. Um, are you familiar with ibogaine? Ibogaine. Huh. So there's a, it's a plant that, uh, it's like a psychedelic thing. A lot of veterans have been using it. Um, there's places down in Mexico that, uh, and I'm actually going to have a, uh, a facilitator of a nonprofit that like lines up and there's been thousands of guys at this point that are going down to, to other places, other countries, because it's not legal here and doing these like several day, Ex, mm. We'll call them mental excursions into things that have, have fixed like tons of fucking guys that I know, love, trust, trust and respect enough for them to say like, dude, I did this and it changed my fucking life and permanently, you know, uh, or for long term at least uh, where it's, it's it kind of to, to oversimplify it. It's basically hitting the reset button on everything in your life. Like it's a lot of it is, is the self-awareness and acceptance and, and the consciousness of, of accepting all of the things that have either happened to you or that you've mm -hmm. done or whatever. Uh, but it, it hits the reset button on that. It hits the reset button on like pain receptors. So, you know, for people that are, is it uh, like similar to ayahuasca? I, I have no idea. You oh, know, okay. I, like I, I've not done it. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily or, or plan on doing it necessarily, but, uh, a lot of guys I know that, that have done it, that, you know, have struggled with certain yeah. substances or, uh, you know, really fucking tough relationships where there was, you know, issues, you know, domestically going on or, or whatever, that it's, it's really turned their lives around. Huh. And I was just curious, you know, as, as kind of in tune as you are with a lot yeah. of the other aspects, if, if you'd heard of it or if you were aware of it, but I know uh, about, I've had a lot of friends who've done the ayahuasca, uh, trips. I'm, maybe a lot of them might've heard about it. I'm definitely yeah. going to find out now. Fuck, it may be the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm but, curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. A couple of just other questions that I had in, in reading the book that I kind of wanted to get your take on it because yeah. they just it seemed like an interesting uh, aspect to it. But uh, animals, right? Obviously, we're animals. But when you talk about animal brain versus uh, you know the human brain, um, and I know you can look at it from an anatomical standpoint and say yes, this animal has a cerebral cortex or it doesn't or whatever. But do you think that there are elements in animals that uh, that you know their train of thought and their mentality exists? Obviously, not with the same level of consciousness that humans. I think, by and large, but where do you kind of shake that out? And, and I'm sure you know some animals are way more so from a conscious standpoint, conscious yeah. than others. Of you know, fish being probably on the lower end of the spectrum. But uh, what is your take on animals by and large that way? Yeah, I mean, I I guess I don't know enough about. Uh, uh, the literal animal brain uh, to sort of make a truly educated comment on that. But yeah, I would agree that 
we are animals. And so when I talk about the animal brain, I'm referring to that limbic system, that sort of the back part of the brain. And then the, the human brain is the prefrontal cortex. I simplify it just in terms of, uh, you know, so it makes it more accessible. But um, I think that, yeah, I mean, especially the smarter animals, like if you look at chimps and everything, from my understanding, I would imagine that they have elements of it that can replicate and uh, have some degree of of awareness of the, cause I mean, what, what makes us human is that I can be aware that I am aware, that I'm aware that I'm here, right? Like I'm, I can transcend my, the isness of this experience to be aware of myself. And um, it is interesting to even like to delve into what, to what degree animals have that. And it's also interesting as we go into AI, to what degree is gonna be a machine be, you know, yeah. uh, aware of that as well. But I don't know enough about, I guess the, 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 the science of the, uh, of a, like an animal brain to, to, I guess, have an educated, yeah, answer to that. Yeah. But I, I'd call it that just for the simplicity of uh, uh, understanding the, the distinction between the two brains of the prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of the brain, the human brain that is related to focus, awareness, rationality, reason that gives us the ability to think, you know, I think therefore I am kind of that to think about our to be aware of our awareness, you know yeah. what I mean? Sure. As opposed to just simply be in the isness. And yeah. there's and like the duality, it, there's both there's value in being both there's, there's tremendous value in being so present that you're not aware of your awareness, because you just are, you know, there's this philosopher, George Bataille, who says like the animal is like water to is to water meaning that we just simply are we just in the isness of this experience whereas then pausing to then reflect i can go meta rise above and be aware of my awareness i can pause and say what am i thinking what am i feeling so for example right now in this conversation with you i'm just here i'm not like thinking about what i'm saying or thinking about you know what i mean i'm just in it uh well and, it shows yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of i think there's value in engaging the animality of, of our humanity as yeah. well as the humanity of our humanity yeah yeah. No. I, I, yeah. I mean, to me, it, it's it's something. Obviously, in, in with what I do for a living, I'm I'm constantly, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what dogs are thinking, where their heads are at, and, and you know what what about what they're doing is reflected by what their mind is dictating versus instinct and genetics versus you know the environment that I'm setting up for them. You know, based off of the, their reaction, maybe to what I'm doing or not doing. And so it's something you know I, I think about fucking day in day yeah. out. You know, yeah. and so. Uh, to me, it's it's fascinating, and, and you know, going to other or going to zoos or to sanctuaries and seeing other animals because I'm so kind of in tune with dogs, and, and I spend so much time thinking about why dogs are doing what they're doing, and, and you know, to me, the the one big difference, I mean, without question, the biggest difference between humans and all other animals is verbal communication. You know, every other fucking species, yes, they use verbal communication. However, ninety nine ninety eight percent of of their interactions and the way that they communicate with each other is, is not using words, mm, mm. you know, not using a, a language, uh, a verbal language or using a nonverbal language and nonverbal communication. Yeah. And so because it, you know, that's something that I spend so much time thinking about and yeah. trying to figure out, et cetera, excuse me, et cetera. You know, I, I was, I found myself thinking, you know, Hey, I wonder, what? you know, what, yeah. How, how many of these concepts, you know, can, can kind of translate to, to dogs in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, to me, the, probably the biggest question that I would that, that comes out of it is, do they have the ability? And I know you can't answer this. It's just something for you know all of us to ponder or choke yourself. Got to throw that in there. <laughs> is that you know do do animals have the ability to appreciate the struggle? You know, to me, mm. I, nobody can answer that. I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's all you know it's all uh, you know just just your your idea of yeah. whether or not it it, it exists. But um, it, it's a curious question yeah, you know yeah. to think like do animals get the the nirvana out of the struggle okay. post you know probably not but who yeah. knows you know maybe the the more conscious yeah, you are as an individual question. uh you know the more it's that way yeah. but uh, what's your thoughts on that that's an interesting question you yeah. ever thought of I, I mean when i think about my fat lazy dog in india he doesn't want to struggle at all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's adorable i love him but uh <laughs> weak as shit uh, <laughs> yeah it's an interesting thought to whether they appreciate the i mean if you look at just if i look at the human beings in in the context of our animality right like when we were cave people like our lives were the the difference between then and now is that they, the the stressors were acute right like let's say saber tooth tiger attacks the stress the stress is temporary and then we go back to a life of comfort and ease right where but the thing is the 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 distinction was that we had threats to life and so we had struggle constantly but we were so inevitably we're seeking out comfort because the um 
the struggle, like the, the threat is very, is, is very real, it's very instant, it can kill us. So we're seeking out comfort and we embrace the comfort. So if you look at like, I think about like a lion, you know, they go for a hunt and then the rest of the time they're just sitting on their ass kind of chilling, you right? So yeah. um, we were that. Now the difference is that we don't have the uh, <laughs> the yeah. the threat to life. So our brain, which is still designed for cave people like that, that environment, it's just, just responding to everything as if it's that, right? So yeah. I think in some senses we, which is kind of this paradoxical thing, we don't, we, we seek out comfort because as a cave person, we don't want to ha be killed, obviously. So on a survival level, we don't want this thing killing us. So we seek out the moments for, of just stress, I mean, uh, stress-free and comfort so we can relax. Yeah. But um, at the same time, we need the struggle that we don't get, or, or again, unless we seek it out in today's environment. Uh, and so I think it's kind of that paradoxical duality that exists around around that, that, uh, you know, does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Just kind it, of pondering. It yeah, it, it does. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, what I see out of dogs is that, you know, one of the things that it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, people say, you know, all dogs need jobs. Like to me, that's, that's humanizing, you know, mm -hmm. the, the way a dog mm -hmm. views the world, which I think is, is most people's biggest mistake is that they're not viewing it through the dog's mind yeah. uh, or, or through the dog's eyes, so to speak. Um, you know, to me, it's not so much that they need a job, it's that they need the same things that, that we need and, and that they need good physical, you know, exercise. They yeah. need good fucking nutrition to fuel their body. Yeah. But then they also need to exercise their mind. You know, and, and where I think that people make mm -hmm. the biggest mistake is they're like, oh, my dog, you know, wants to fucking chew everything up and he's a pain in my ass, whatever, so I'm going to take him for a six-mile run every day. You know, or I'm going to play ball with them for fucking four and a half hours in the afternoon after a six mile run. And what you're doing is you're basically conditioning a bigger asshole, you know, because mm. it's the, the physical component, just like with us, like if all you do is work out, that's not going to do it. Like if all you do yeah. is work out and you're fed shitty food and, and you have no, you know, cognitive challenge whatsoever yeah. and no mental engagement, you're still going to be fucking miserable. Yeah. You're just going to be in really good shape and be yeah. fucking miserable. And <laughs> yeah. so with dogs, it's the same thing. It's, it's not that they need a fucking job. It's that they need to use their goddamn brain the same way we do. They need to use Makes their sense. body Makes the sense. same way we do. They need yeah. to be fed proper fuel the same way we do. And so it's something as simple as just shaping their behavior with say a, a clicker and food and using fucking anything i mean you can use an elevated dog bed or just set a dog bed and teach your dog to go to it to come to you to fucking run a circle around it to touch it with his nose i mean there's a million fucking yeah. things that you can do in your living room or in your garage or a spare bedroom or, or whatever in your classroom that i talk about in, in the team dog dot pet <laughs> dog training uh you know is, is setting up that environment so that yeah that you can you get them to use their fucking brain and just like with us you know when you're in college you know, we've all had experiences where we've been, you know, mentally stressed using our brain to study or to do a project yeah. for work or whatever, where you weren't doing anything physical, you know, and at the end of the day or the you're week tired. or the month or the project, you're fucking exhausted. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we're having a long emotional conversation with a spouse or a child or, or whatever, same thing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Is that, you know, to pick one thing like the, the, the mental stimulation and engagement that you get from from using it uh, appropriately is is in my experience far more fucking satisfying and tiring than you know a fucking three hour jujitsu roll. Now when you do both coupled with great nutrition, now you're firing on yeah, all the fucking yeah. cylinders. But you my, all elements, yeah, yeah, my point to that without getting too off on a tangent is that you know dogs are no different that that way. When people say, well, he just needs a job, like he needs to go do this, like not necessarily, and, and exactly. actually probably not. Like he just needs to use his fucking mind the same way we all do. I got but, you. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I did remember reading, and I, I, I probably know your answer to it, similar to the, the other question I posed about, uh, um, you know, the, just the one I asked earlier that kind of pushed back a little bit, I guess. But the you talk a little bit about the situation not being all your fault, which agreed, like nobody's situation. A lot of times situations are largely not your fault. Have you run into, because one of the things that I thought about in reading it in several different places where it's like, hey, don't beat yourself up too much, which I agree on the same token, like I think that can be taken so far to where now you're not taking accountability for shit either. Roger where, where do you draw that yeah. line in, in, in keeping people between the lines of saying, look, yeah, like your lot in life, the cards you're dealt, like that's not your fault. You didn't fucking choose that. On the same token, like understanding that you can't control that is half of it too. Like, yeah. So where, where do you kind of yeah. draw that line? So it kind of ties into that myth of free will and that man is a machine uh, quote, right? Like accepting the isness of how you've been shaped, how we've been raised, that this is all this shit has shown up for a particular reason. 
accepting that is when you stop you stop judging the emotion around that so if i come back to like the survivor's guilt or the veteran thing you know like like for example i worked with one veteran who uh the, the 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 person he was seeing this therapist told him anger is just a choice you need to stop being angry so every time he felt angry he was beating himself up for being angry and i told him right now anger is not a choice anymore your brain has created a pattern any stimuli that doesn't go your way you're responding with anger so when i say you stop beating yourself up like right now don't beat yourself up for the having the anger notice the anger so and for the first time in seven years after the war he would pause just be with the anger notice what the emotion is and let go of that judgment like oh i'm fucked up what's wrong with me i'm a piece of shit all that kind of stuff around the anger and be with it to then to then not be defined by it so there's a space between the emotion and our conscious response to it so that's what i mean you acknowledge that i can't control this anymore this is just a pattern like again somebody comes in this room with a gun i'm not going to beat myself up for being like I get another example i took my wife out rock climbing right and she we were on this climb and what for me was a very easy climb so I wasn't scared at all and she was terrified so she was climbing we finally got to the top came back down and the, on the car ride back we were chatting about it and she was kind of like you know why was i scared you weren't scared i'm weak i'm like if i'm scared of this little thing i'm gonna never write my book i'm just she's going down this rabbit hole of this self-talk of you know like i'm a piece of shit all that kind of stuff the only reason i didn't feel scared was because i had climbed much harder climbs my brain didn't have had a reference that said this is not warranting a risk this is not scary you know so it, it's okay so the key thing is acknowledging that these emotions that show up in response to external stimuli are things we more often than not don't control. With that said, once you acknowledge that, that's what I mean by let go of the judgment, let go of the responsibility, then you can then take responsibility for how I, what I do with it, how I respond to it. Now you say like, okay, okay, great. I don't control that my brain gets scared with the climb. Now I acknowledge that space. Now I get to decide, do I still choose to be like not do anything with it do i choose to acknowledge the fear do i choose to how do i respond to that fear i still get scared as shit you know i still go into dark spaces i still struggle with things of course like we all do and i can acknowledge that some of this shit might not be things that like i'm consciously choosing their su their subconscious response to stimuli like i can for example acknowledge that my dopamine wiring might be flawed now i can sit here and be and whine about it and complain about it like even my thalassemia i can complain that my body has less oxygen but that's just the reality i'm accepting it now, great, it is there. What am I going to do with it? I'm still choosing to run ultra marathons. You know what I mean? So you kind of accept that I don't control X, but now that I accept that I don't control X, now I get to seize control of my world. And then you shape your world. Then it's all on you. Yeah. So it's kind of acknowledging that um, we are a machine, the myth of free will. I actually call it, so one, one thing that might actually help is I call it the, the two darts, the second dart syndrome. Yeah. So this, is, this could be a helpful context on how to answer that. So Buddha said we're all stabbed by the two darts of suffering. The first dart, like if I stub my toe against a door, is the pain in my toe. The second dart is when I start saying things like, this house is stupid, this door is stupid, God hates me, why do bad things only happen to me? And it's that self-dialogue. So the first dart is the thing we don't control. I'm scared when somebody comes into a room with a gun, I'm scared on a rock climb, I ac accept that. The second dart is how I respond to it. So that's what I mean. Accept the first dart, choose what you wanna do with the second dart. Yeah. And that requires a relentless, and I mean relentless practice of constant self-awareness. What if I pull the second dart out and re-stab myself with it? <laughs> that's what a lot of people do. We, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. We go yeah. down that rabbit hole. And so yeah. that's how I reframed even my guilt. Like, the guilt is there. Everybody said, don't feel guilty. Shit, everybody. Yeah. And rationally, I get it, right? Like, rationally, I get it. I could have gone to war with Neil. He could have still died. I could have still come back. All that good stuff. It doesn't change the emotional fact around it. Yeah. Everybody, therapists, friends, family. And I get it. They're all saying from a place of love. Don't feel guilty. And then finally, with all this stuff, I realized, like, look, the guilt is there. It's just an expression of the love. Like it's an expression of the camaraderie that you know we we go through when you go through that so i accept it's there now the second dart is look do i want to like respond to the guilt by drinking myself stupid or do i want to use that guilt to fuel me to do some meaningful work in the world and that's where you got to take responsibility for your shit because at some point look we're all we're all no parents raised us perfectly all parents did we, we all gone through some shit that shaped our brain in a way that's probably not helping us yeah accept the awareness of it and then you can keep whining about it or then you can take responsibility for it yeah no, I think it's it's a huge fucking part of, of our society, especially, um, you know, in, in, in having children and seeing other kids and just seeing, you know, successive generations, uh, you know, one after the fucking next and, and the things that, you know, plague them. And, and I, I get that it's all relative and, you know, what's a big deal at, at 13 doesn't make a shit bit of difference at, at 40. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's still a big deal and whatever, but it's, it's like trying to have those conversations with, uh, with kids and with, you know, again, the, the subsequent generations coming that, uh, you know, trying to make them realize like, Hey, 
just not as bad as you think it is, you know, and, and it's, it's a hard concept, I think, yeah. to, to get people across. They're like, well, how the fuck would you know? You know, it's like, well, no, I, you know, I didn't go exactly through what you've gone through, but you know, when I, when I look historically at like in, you know, in 1940, when, you know, a kid your yeah. age would be on a fucking train going to, to Auschwitz, you know, and you'd watch your mom and I get our heads cut off, like, and then you'd get, you know, put to work and, and starved for four years. Like, I don't think having your phone taken away for three yeah. days is, is probably quite on that fucking level, yeah. you know, but it's, it's, if that's all they fucking know, like if that's the worst thing that's happened to them, like that's a good problem to have, but it's also a bad problem to have. But that's the problem is because I think the biggest mistake I see with parents is we don't, the kids don't suffer enough today. Yeah. And as a result, they're going through even worse struggle. They're going through all this internal psychological shit because we're not giving our kids the beauty of adversity. Yeah. We're sheltering our kids to the degree that when life throws one little curveball their way, they freak out because yeah. now we haven't built any resilience. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing I taught, especially in India, like well-off people I see in India, they overspoiled their kids like nobody's business. I mean, I have extended family that I hope doesn't listen to your show because they're going to know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I, but, I think they do. No, I'm pretty sure they're listening. Because they're yeah. going to hear me talking I've shit. Got a, I've got a but, big fan base in India. <laughs> When they're going to hear, because like, I mean, I can't tell you how much they overspoil their kids yeah. and I see the effect. Now these kids have zero fucking resilience. So yeah. you got to let a kid suffer a little I, bit. I am going to promote the shit out of this episode <laughs> in India. I'm going to fucking blow it up over there. Fucking sponsored gonna, ads I'm, I'm all over have, the place. I'm going to have a lot of, a lot of family coming back and hurt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you talk a little bit about nature versus nurture, just because it, it again, it's such a big thing in, in dogs and dog training as yeah. it relates to working dogs, not as much in pets or it's not. It's not as prevalent because there's not as, as much on the line, I guess you'd, you'd say. But um, my take is it's not an either or, it's both. Yeah. You know, is, is that like there are elements of being a product of your environment, but there's also genetic hardwirings, complications, or, or things that are going to impact or dictate how big of an impact your nature has on you or not uh, yeah kind of what is your take as it relates to explaining it to people and because to me where you know again in reading a couple of things i can see where when people you know they're they're looking for a reason to not have to blame themselves you know and, and when it's like oh it's you know it's all on how they're raised or you know it's it's all fucking you know like well no it isn't like a, a lot of it is is genetic you know and, and so yeah you know, what, what I worry about is people see, you know, the, well, it's not your fault. And it's like, no, that's fuck. It's not my fault. There's nothing I can do about it. You know? So it's like, yeah, I'm just, no, I'm going to fail. Cause it's fuck. It's that's the cards I was dealt like, yeah. no motherfucker. Like, so, you know, not to kind of beat a dead horse or come back to it, but, no, totally. but nature versus nurture, how do you kind of, you know, approach that from, yeah. from your standpoint in, in a bit in the business that you're in? I totally agree with you that it's definitely a bit of both. You accept the reality of the FX. Like, I mean, again, like I come back to, I'm flat footed. I have scoliosis. I have thalassemia. Is None that on of your these Tinder things... profile? <laughs> right. It's a hell of a way to start. I know. Yeah. With a, with a Shrek these. fucking uh, <laughs> Halloween costume. <laughs> Uh, I have another thing that yeah. like when I got an endoscopy, the doctors told me the villi in my esophagus are worn out so my body can't absorb nutrients well. So none of these four things are conducive to ultra running, right? None of these <clears throat> things. Now I can accept that's a genetic thing like and, and, and know it's there, but I don't let it define me. So when I say it's not your fault, like, yeah, I didn't choose to have thalassemia, that, that shit's there. But what you do with it is then the value, especially on a neurological level and in terms of brain patterning, the value is acknowledging that. Like even with me, again, I don't have brain scans to prove this, but I would guess I probably have some flawed dopamine wiring in my brain. Yeah. Now I can accept that's there and everything about my life pattern would kind of validate that. But now the, the thing is I can use that as something beautiful. Like the same addiction that drove me to downing a bottle of vodka a day for a week is driving me to, has driven me to write a book, build a business, run ultra marathon, ski across ice caps and do all this awesome shit that I've done. Yeah. So you accept what is, but then use it, you know, use it to, and then, and that's when you really got to take, like, I mean, it's kind of this paradoxical thing. I say, while, you know, it's not your fault. Well, the way I approach the world is everything is your fault. Like I literally, I mean, if a plane crashes into a fucking building next to me, I'm going to be like, how did I make that happen? Yeah. Even though I didn't. Right. But like, the thing is, if you take complete control of your world, hundred percent responsibility for how your world is shaped, 
you then get to define it. And that's a double-edged sword because now if your world is not where you're going, guess whose fucking fault it is? It's yeah. on you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like, there's only two things you can control, your actions or your attitude. Now, unless you're in a war zone where you don't have any freedom, like in Auschwitz, like people like that, like you don't have the freedom to control your actions, you control your attitude. I mean, one of my favorite books of all time is Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, right? The guy was in a concentration camp and he found beauty in that suffering. He found meaning in that suffering. Yeah. And he talks about the last of human freedoms is our ability to choose our, choose our own attitude in any given circumstance. So we can ultimately, our world is shaped by our actions and attitude. The point of acknowledging what is not our fault is to, and that's why the first section is awareness and acceptance. You, you get aware of that stuff accept it, then it's about taking action and doing something with it. Yeah. I mean, I could sit here, be binge drinking uh, and be a fucking victim my whole life, right? Like, oh, woe is me, life got hard. Yeah, I mean, it is, life is hard on everybody. Yeah. Do something about it, you yeah. know? So it's like, it's, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's why again, they both coexist. It's yeah. not one or the other, nature and nurture. Yeah. You acknowledge that I, all this degenic shit, who, who cares? Yeah. I mean, I might, like from what I understand, because I have this, I might take longer to get better at running, but that's not like a barrier, you know, that's, then I run harder, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, is get, what it is. Get more runs in. <laughs> and, and I'm doing pretty good as an ultra runner, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> have you worked with any uh, vets uh, having trouble with like opioids and things like that has, has that come across your i've i've worked with people with uh with addiction with vets i haven't worked on a mass scale i've worked with a few i mentioned this one who struggled with anger issues and a few other things around ptsd um with not as much around i mean again i worked with a few people with addiction issues but not so necessarily a ton of vets with opioids yeah what, what is, i mean i'm assuming it's while there's some variance you know person to person and substance to substance like the the mentality behind it is largely the same what is the um kind of the approach that you take with that the, when it comes to addiction, so one, we got to confront the thing we're escaping from, right? Like there usually there's something we're escaping from. So we got to go into those spaces. That shit is hard. A lot of people don't want to do that. Hence we, uh, you know, and again, same thing from my personal experience. So kind of confronting the demons around what, or the demons of the darkness, whatever you want to call it, that you're, that you're well running away from. Cause no matter what you're running away from something, uh, that's why we're escaping. That's why we're doing the drugs or the, uh, alcohol, whatever it may be. And then a big thing that I've noticed too, with addiction is you have to fill that void with something. So you gotta find that worthy struggle. You have to fill that void with something. The few, I mentioned two friends who died from uh, addiction, they, they came out and they didn't have a worthy struggle to consume them. So that void cannot, it cannot be just a void or you're gonna go back into the pattern. You're gonna go into the darkness. So, you know, a lot of things we do talk about creating joy triggers. How do you create, how do you, how do you activate that dopamine in your life? Because a lot of addiction, we're seeking dopamine, right? So how do we find healthier ways to do it? Exercise is one of the most valuable things you can do for sure uh, in, in activating dopamine, finding that worthy struggle. It, but it's, it's, like a, it's a really hard battle because life's gonna get hard again. No matter what you yeah. do, you can't <clears throat> avoid that. I mean, like I said, I broke my sobriety. Life gets hard again, you know? And, um, and that's so fundamentally, then we come back to building a positive relationship to suffering. Yeah. How do you learn to train in suffering, to smile in suffering, to fall in love with the experience of it, that when shit gets hard, which it will, and, and you can find beauty even in the pain. That's as an ultra runner, that's the essence of it. I mean, I have runs where I'm like this fucking, like 80 miles around a point two mile loop. It was, it fucking sucked, yeah. you know? But then as soon as the run is done, I'm planning the next one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you- well, I'm you, figuring out how to kick myself in the nuts all over <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So you gotta like, you gotta fill that void with something. You gotta fall in love with the suck. You gotta confront the darkness. And th that's why the challenge is nothing about that process is easy. Yeah. Nothing about that process is easy. Yeah. Um, in talking about the myth of free will, have you had any conflict with like hardline Christians about that? Because free will is such a huge fucking gift from God, so to speak. I'm not a religious guy, by yeah. the way, but... Is that something that you've dealt with or have people not fucking called you on that at all? Not personally in terms of, but we've, I've had conversations in a philosophical way with friends around it because we've talked about why that would be so hard is because, yeah, human beings like to believe we are autonomous, free thinking creatures. And the idea that we are not is hard to, hard to, to gather. And I mean, I talk about in the book, the neuroscience studies that have actually shown that they'll, re they'll put brain scans on people and they'll register in their brain few milliseconds before they actually, so if I pick up this water bottle here, my brain has registered that action milliseconds before I'm actually doing it. And so that's kind of daunting to think about that it, then if, I, if I'm not choosing this, is everything around me, is everything, am I just, um, 
Am I just a creature of everything that shaped me who I am today? Well, here's the good news with that, right? <laughs> you know this is going to be a smart-ass kind of, Is it Now when you fuck up with the old lady, it's like, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's like, I didn't, I didn't even <laughs> choose to fucking do that, right? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't choose it, yeah, exactly. It's not my exactly. Fault. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fucking great. Um, man, I got to tell you, you've got a fucking awesome story. Uh, Thank you, boy. Super interesting fucking dude. Uh, the book is fucking great. And, and I'm going to tell you straight up, like, I'm going to have... My children read it, um, even to where it's negative for them. I'm going to make sure that they have a negative impact from it. I'm going to force them to do it. No. <laughs> it's a book that I'd recommend, honestly, to fucking everybody. You know, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. Like, you know, I've had a lot of people with books on, and and they're all good. Like, I, you know, I don't have people with shitty books on, but, uh, but you know, a lot of them, most of them, are, are kind of genreed into you know either military or or you know first responder, law enforcement, yeah. whatever combat stories or you know some nutrition stuff whatever but to me you know the the neat thing about your book is that it's it's all encompassing really for everybody you know and i'm not saying that because i'm getting a percentage of (laughs) of your book sales like you know it's it really is like i mean I, i really think fucking anybody you know past the age of probably 13 or 14 uh you know younger than that maybe is a is a little over over the top yeah. or over their head for them but maybe consider doing a fucking children's version i don't know not not even being a smart ass like I, I think reducing it to a young adult you know almost oversimplified version uh it'd actually probably be good for a lot of Dude. adults too while you're bullshitting yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh my point is is it's it's a fucking really good book it's Appreciate very that, profound brother. but it's thank you but it's very simple to to follow and and uh, just tons of good quotes. I love how how many other um, authors and and just people in in a lot of different spaces, not just in like psychology, uh, you know, but but other other people that have pretty profound quotes that are kind of scattered in in throughout the book that uh, that just really help round it out. I, I did want to ask: Did you write it a hundred percent by yourself? Yeah, one hundred percent by myself. Yeah, it took a minute. As I said, it took a little while because what happened was. I wrote it and then I remember sending it to my publisher and then as I was editing it, I was changing as a person. So I almost rewrote it. Like I probably trashed like a hundred thousand plus words, literally not exaggerating, hundred thousand yeah. plus words to finally get to where it is now. But I mean I'm now it's something I'm proud of, but so I'm glad I you know, but I wouldn't do it the same way again. But yeah, I wrote it hundred percent myself. So a yeah. lot of research went into it. I yeah. mean I read a hundred plus books to yeah. research this. Yeah. And then it was also very cathartic for myself and then interviewing the people. I mean shit, you remember reading it. It's not a light read, I, which I'm not unaware of, but like interviewing this one young woman who had been raped at six years old and then gang raped by five people. 15 you know her story like unfucking believable who she is and in her resilience you know yeah. so just interviewing the kind of people and going through that whole process was profound yeah. uh, that's what took a took a bit yeah. yeah you know you're not asking for my advice to me just from like a business standpoint like a, a kid's version and then also sense. like a, yeah. a fucking workbook you know yeah, like for people like, that. Yeah. yeah you know just uh you know how do, how do i you know because it's it's a lot easier to read and be like, yeah, fuck, that makes sense. Same thing with dog training. Like you can read my my dog training book and, and be like, oh yeah, it makes lots of sense. How do you apply it? Yeah, you know, is a, is a whole different fucking animal. But uh, but really, really fucking good. Um, Thank you, brother. It's, again, it's called Fearvana for you YouTube assholes. I'm holding it up right now. <laughs> um, it is available on Amazon. That's where I got it from, and he brought me several other copies, which I'm not going to give away to you assholes. <laughs> I'm going to give away to people that I care about. Not that I don't care about you. Uh, anyway, the um, I do care about you. I do want to take a quick second to say, um, you know, for those of you listening in the times that we're in right now, uh, a, a special thank you uh, for everybody that's listening. I know I've had a lot of people ask me quite a bit over the last, you know, week, 10 days, two weeks with uh, all this coronavirus shit going on. Like, we need more episodes and whatever. So we are trying to crank out uh, a number of them uh, for you in, in this time to give you some good content. This one... For sure, uh, I think you're going to enjoy. I know you will, uh, and I can't can't recommend enough. Go get that book. It's it's really really fucking good. But uh, last thing, speaking of the coronavirus stuff, what is your take on um, this? You know, presenting itself as a challenge, both individually as a society, as a as a globe, mm-hmm. uh, and and how do you apply some of the principles from your book from uh, Fearvana as an organization to what's going on right now? Yeah. Well, one thing we're seeing is people are being controlled by their fear brain, you know, and this we are clearly seeing all all the some of the madness around it is. And this brings back to sort of the fundamental concept. There's that space between the emotion and the reason. And I'll I'll actually quote Viktor Frankl, which is, I think, one of the more 
uh, profound quotes in, in terms of how do we master any environment, whether it be convert, co environments or anything else. He says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies our power to choose our response, and in our response lies our growth and our freedom. How do you remember all this shit? By Some the of them I just uh, yeah. quote a lot, like uh, Victor Frankl, yeah. Carl. I probably quote Victor Frankl and Carl Jung more than anybody else yeah. <laughs> because they're just some of the most profound shit that yeah. I've ever come across. But that <clears> one is to me the essence of it. Like, there, yeah, I'm a, I agree there's some scary shit happening, but let's acknowledge the fear. Let's notice the fear and then how there's a space, how we respond to it. People aren't acknowledging that space. And here's the one thing, like nobody would have wanted coronavirus to happen. I'm not saying no, but now what we're seeing is there's a collective suffering handed upon us as a, as a hu human family, as a hu humanity. And so in some scenes, we're also seeing people come together like they've never come together because we have a common enemy now, right? Like humanity is coming together as a common enemy. Yeah. And there's some beautiful things happening here as a result. And and again, I'm, no, I'm not saying I would have wanted this to happen or anything like that, but experiences of great adversity reveal the essence of humanity at its extremes. It's like war, for example, man. Mm -hmm. You know this. I mean, like war brings out the very worst in humanity. People do fucking awful shit, but it brings out the very best. People jump on grenades. Gary Gordon, Randy Sugar, you know, from Black Hawk Down, who got the Medal of Honor. People do incredible things as self-sacrifice for others. Experiences of great adversity bring out the nobility of man, the nobility of human beings, and the worst. And now it's up to you what you do with this. Yeah. It's here whether we like it or not. Acknowledge the fear. Understand the fear. I'm not saying it's not. It's a situation that warrants some fear. No doubt it does. But use it. Use it as an opportunity. I mean, little things. I've seen people, like we've seen some of these basketball players who are paying for the, uh, you know, the hourly wages at the stadiums that are closed. Or simple things like reach out to an old person who's 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 on their own. Like shoot a text over. You Sh know, go shake their hand. Go shake their hand. <laughs> Fuck yeah. I mean, like you know, do things. Do things that are an act of kindness. And we're seeing that on a little scale. Uh, you know, like you can't. The babysitter can't come. Pay her anyway. You know yeah. what I mean? Like this is an opportunity to use a suffering that's been inflicted upon us because I mean, that's the whole everything we've been talking about is suffering is how you transcend. Suffering yeah. is a training ground for self-transcendence. Suffering is how you build something greater. We've been handed to us. What we do with it is on us. Yeah, and to me, the, the biggest thing to draw from that, I think, uh, you know, for everybody listening is, is the acceptance part is to accept that it's here it's a part of life absolutely and leave it the fuck at that you yeah. know like don't go buy every fucking carton of eggs that you can find like a fucking asshole like you know live your life as as close to normal as possible you know to me is is you know is my advice to anybody that, that gives enough of a fuck to, to listen and, and hopefully apply it you know because to me it's like I, I haven't stocked up on anything I mean and I, and I think that the, the biggest problem that I have with this mentality, the, the rat race mentality that's affecting so many people irrationally is, is that is that it's, it's actually causing more problems than the virus itself. 100%, yeah. Just in how you're overreacting to it. You know, yeah. no, that doesn't mean you ignore it. That doesn't mean that you do dumb shit yeah. and, and, you know, go out of your way to, to spread it. But it also means that, you know, you don't fuck over everybody else by being a selfish prick and, and whatever. And, you know, and, and for people that, you know, that, to me, what one, one of the things that's a little irritating is that, you know, people that have staff, uh, you know, on in jobs where like as soon as there's no customers, they have no fucking money and, and they've got to let people go like. You know, to me, it, it's a little irritating to see that happen, like where it's especially bigger, you know, medium sized businesses where that's happening you know, within a few days of money not coming in, like, are you, are you that underprepared yeah. from a cash flow standpoint to where like, you know, we're musicians that like fire their entire staff because their tour stopped a few weeks earlier. But it's like, well, how, you know, clearly you're making a fuck ton of money. Yeah, like, yeah. how are you that fucking ill prepared? Like to me yeah. that that's kind of a bullshit fucking thing too. Like, and that goes into everything else is that, you know, everybody realized that, you know, there's going to be things that suck for everybody. Uh, each person's going to be a little different. Yeah. But but to accept that and not let it, you know, drive fear to the point where now you're acting irrationally, yeah. I think is the most important part. Absolutely. Of it. I always like to say that fear propels you to prepare. You talked about prepared. So when you engage the fear, in, like even writing a book on fear, I was terrified that people would think it's shitty, it'd be bad, it'd be horrible. You know, people would get a one star review or some shit on Amazon. Yeah. So I engaged it. What am I scared of? How can I prepare for it? What's the worst case scenario? So when you engage the fear, you can understand and prepare for it. So I studied how do you write a good book? Because I was scared of writing a bad book, I studied how to write a good book. Yeah. The same thing applies now. Like engage the fear, prepare. I'm not, but don't be, and partly we're seeing because just, I, I just think as a culture, we become more individualistic. So we don't give two shits about the people next to us. Yeah. Uh, and we got to like, 
as as because the suffering is handed upon us, we can now use it as an opportunity to come together. I mean, that's why one of the things I mean you can relate to I treasure about my experience in the military was the camaraderie, man. Yeah. You live for the good of the group. Nobody gives a shit how you feel in the military. Yeah. What matters is there is the is the mission and the yeah. men. So, do you think that uh, there's any element of we'll just say from a population standpoint, right? Is that the globe can really only handle so many fucking people. Is there any, maybe you call it a conspiracy theory, is there any element of, of your mentality that uh, relates or thinks that it's Mother Nature making a fucking correction? I have thought that, yeah, because we've seen like these, these string of... Um natural disasters happening and it's like sometimes if you again i don't i don't know all these answers to these things but if you look at it like it's almost seems like the world's fighting back against uh, uh human beings because we're, yeah we're yeah. kind of dumbasses sometimes we we are, we're no longer living with the land we're taking over and as a result we're like yeah i agree that to a certain degree i mean i wonder is like is is just sort of the world fighting back and saying you guys are fucking up this one yeah. this yeah, <laughs> you well, know? yeah i mean like you know uh clint Emerson that uh, wrote the 100 Deadly Skills books. He and I have, you know, he lives here in town. He's one of my closest friends. And we've had a couple talks about that. One of the things he's said for years, and, you know, he's talked about pandemics for years and yeah. has, has a lot of plans in place. Uh, I was thinking about actually having him on to do a, an episode just just on pandemics, given given the nature of what's going on. Yeah. But, um, you know, he one of the things that he says, and I don't know if he, if he came up with it or stole it or whatever, but the, the gist of it is extinction is the norm survival is the exception you know if, if you look at the globe historically billions of years is that you know there, there's things have come and gone and come and gone and come and gone and there's a reason for that you know pick you know whatever animal dinosaurs fucking plants yeah. you name it yeah you know is is that there's a reason that they come and go and and, and that's normal like human beings included is that you know there's going to come a time where there aren't any of us you know and and how that happens you know some of it's going to be dictated by us some of it you know yeah. is going to be mother nature some of it's the fucking universe and yeah, how that yeah. all lines up or whatever but but you know realizing that like there's there's a little bit of a fucking doomsday negativity you know component to that but again i think it all boils down to a lot of what you talk about is, is acceptance like realize that that's just what it is you can't fucking you know d determine whether or not that's happening uh by a large degree yeah yeah and uh and so you know that that's the first fucking step you know but what do you uh, do with it yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting shit for sure uh, all right so we've talked about the book if you could just kind of talk to people about what you do now and how they can find you and, and yeah. all the different things that, that you offer people yeah. basically uh so now what i do with fear of Vana, we're actually building like a whole kind of movement around it and series of products and services in multiple verticals. Like the vision is kind of what Richard Branson did with Virgin. I want to build with Fearvana, but unlike Virgin, I'm not looking to get into sort of mobile or airline or anything like that. Staying in the space of mastery over the mind, mind body, spirit. So we're creating like a Fearvana fitness, Fearvana festivals, Fearvana retreats. I have my own nonprofit called the Fearvana Foundation. All the profits from the book go to, go to the foundation. We support like young girls who are victims of sex trafficking in India to former child soldiers in West Africa. So we support some really cool causes. Uh, and we're building like this whole thing, a Fearvana journey. Fearvana, uh, Fearvana Academy, just an ecosystem. So right now we're launching like a clothing line. This is a Fearvana t-shirt, oh, cool. Memento Mori, so remember death. Uh, that's what that means, remember yeah. death. Um, and we're creating Fearvana supplements. I do public speaking, I do consulting, I sell products. I sell digital training, training products online. So I have products that go deeper into the concepts of Fearvana. Like I have a digital training program called Win at Everything on how do you master your mind and to win it, whatever you put your mind to. So we have a series of different things that we're creating to ultimately help people embrace. Uh, I mean, the core ethos, what we're looking to do through these various things is help people develop a positive relationship to suffering so they can find, live and love their worthy struggle. That's yeah. the, e that's the essence of yeah. it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's a lot of shit going on. Where, where can people find you? Fear. So you can find me on fearvana.com okay. and the books again on Amazon at uh, Kindle Audible and uh, paperback. And like I said, all the profits go to charity. Yeah. Uh, any social media handles you want to throw out? Yeah, Instagram, uh, Instagram, Fearvana is the one I'm most active on. YouTube is at Fearvana as well. Yeah, Rock appreciate it. Like I said, man, you fucking super interesting cat, and uh, Thank I you, appreciate bro. you bringing bringing the book and the story. And appreciate you and, having you me. You know, yeah, that's my pleasure. It really is. I, I learned a lot from your book, and I really, really like it. Thank um, you. I would like to take a minute to thank uh, Origin Labs. Jocko Fuel, uh, the sponsor of the podcast, they've been a consummate supporter for a long time now. Uh, the Jocko Fuel stuff, that line has a ton of products. You had some Jocko Go. It's, it's fucking yeah, great. It's awesome. <laughs> um, he's got a ton of different products. Origin Labs does as well. They also make geese, uh, boots, jeans uh, that I'm actually wearing a pair right now. They do massage your ass while you wear them. Um, 
you know, they may even tickle your prostate. I don't know. I can't confirm nor deny. Great, great company, though. They, they really are. I mean, they, they go above and beyond, uh, you know, doing it the right way. They make everything here in the, in the United States uh, extremely fucking supportive of, of veterans and veteran families uh, and just kind of bringing, bringing the, the industry back to the United States the, the way that it should be uh, in, in all of what they do. It's a, it's a really remarkable company, and I'm, I'm humbled and honored to have uh, their sponsorship and support. So uh, Jocko Fuel Origin Labs uh, kicking ass. Uh, thanks to them, as always. Uh, to you, the listener. Um, you know, again, especially in these times, you know, there's a lot of uh, white noise out there. There's a lot of things to be paying attention to. The fact that you tune into uh, to this show uh, means the world to me. It, it really does. I uh, can't thank you enough for your support. Uh, it's it's been an amazing journey, uh, which will continue. Uh, but without your support, uh, I, I wouldn't wouldn't be doing this. Wouldn't be where it is. Um, you know, and, and wouldn't be able to bring you these episodes with interesting guests like uh, like today's. So, thank you to you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Go choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.